Hashem Hashem Nasa Natsliach Shur Torah Bukhim Abayim. We are uh, back on our Wednesday night. Uh, Shur doing uh, questions and answers that stumped the rabbi. We're after a little bit of Divrei Torah. Bezat Hashem, you guys will ask some questions. The Kadosh Baruch will give us the answers. Tonight's Shur will be for a uh, Refua Shlema for Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, Avi Mori David Ben Esriya, uh, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, uh, Orit Bat uh, Ilana, Sara Bat Sausan, uh, and also for a uh, Atzlacha Raba uh, for uh, Amir Ben Shahin, um, Oshri Ben Doris, Gabi Ben Doris, Elad Ben Doris, uh, Marsha Bat Juli, Ayla Bat Marsha, uh, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sefas Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, Louis Ben Marsha, Itro Ben Avraham, um, and uh, all of Am Israel, and also uh, Shaul Ben Farzane. And uh, all of Am Israel and all of the righteous Noahides that uh, continue to do the right thing, overcome the obstacles that are uh, simply everywhere. Uh, and of course, trying to do the will of a Kadosh Baruch Hu at all costs. Uh, so uh, with that being said, I'll give you a little bit of a brief update, couple of uh, uh, big things, Bezot uh, Hashem. So uh, first and foremost, we, uh, we thought about uh, how uh, you know, we've been trying to get a place and uh, that uh, hasn't happened yet, but there's other Shem will get one soon. But uh, because I know that there's a, a pretty big demand of uh, people that actually, uh, you know, want to see me face to face and uh, ask questions face to face, people from out of town, people from town. Uh, so we decided that uh, uh, we're going to start doing Bez of the Shem a, a monthly event. A monthly event. We're going to start with a our first uh, uh, event. Uh, it's going to be at a uh, resort uh, in a few weeks in uh, in Florida here in the Bonaventura uh, Resort uh, on uh, January nineteenth. Bezat Hashem. The uh, the information Bezat Hashem will be publi- publicized uh, probably uh, later this week. Uh, but for those of you that are uh, watching right now or tomorrow, uh, just uh, you know check your calendars, and if you want to uh, to come, uh, please make sure to RSVP. Um, and uh, there's other shame. We'll see how how it goes. Uh, we're uh, I don't know how many people are actually going to come, how many people are not going to come, uh, but uh, we figured that uh, a lot of people are asking. Uh, to to have an actual event, to have uh, you know uh, regular lectures like we used to have, uh, and uh, quite frankly, I've, as I've told you guys many times, I'm tired of the uh, synagogue politics uh, that happen from place to place and keep changing places, and pretty much uh, almost made a vow, uh, you know, uh, uh, mentally, that uh, I'm not going to speak at any shuls anymore. Uh, I just really don't have much of an interest. Uh, it's too much headache. It's too much. Uh, it's just too much. Too much goes with it. Uh, so we figured that the next thing we're going to do is our own place. But since that's going to take a little bit of time, we figured that uh, you know there is definitely a need and there is definitely a uh, desire to uh, to to see everybody. So we're going to start doing monthly events at uh, at this uh, at this particular place maybe perhaps some other places but we're gonna do it at resorts we're not gonna do it at synagogues anymore uh, and Bezot uh, Hashem go from there so this is uh, for anybody that wants to come from out of town from anybody that wants to come from town whatever it is it's going to be I believe January 19th and then uh, perhaps uh, Bezot Hashem we're gonna do it every month we have uh, a team of people that are working on this particular project alone uh, to schedule an event once a month, uh, and uh, but each event is going to Bezat Hashem be bigger than the next. Uh, perhaps we'll start with me, and then little by little, maybe we'll even bring some other rabbis. Perhaps even if there's enough people, when we get to a uh, like what I think we can get to, uh, maybe even start doing uh, multi-day events uh, where people can come, stay for several days, uh, have like a seminar uh, once a month. So this is a uh, one of the ideas we are implementing 
uh, starting with uh, next, next few weeks. We've already signed the contract with the first place, uh, and uh, we'll go from there. As other shame. For anybody that has uh, questions or wants to RSVP, you could either wait for the information or you could just uh, email uh, Leah at bezatashem.org. Uh, secondly, um, this is the uh, we have about a week, a little over a week left in the uh in the calendar year the gregorian calendar and although uh we as jews do not uh, care for the gregorian calendar especially since it's a uh, it symbolizes the idolatry uh of christianity nonetheless this is still the way of the world uh and uh most people especially people that uh are uh, living in the uh, u.s or different countries that uh uh, you know, work uh, closely with U.S. in regards to taxes and donations. Typically, people make their biggest donations during the uh, last part of the year. Uh, and because of that, we typically have our biggest uh, campaigns, uh, you know, during this time of the year. And uh, truth be told, uh, we were supposed to launch the campaign uh, just in the, uh, you know, in the last several days to at least give people, uh, you know, a week, uh, two weeks, uh, two weeks before, um, uh, before, uh, you know, the year to actually have this campaign to try to raise, uh, a few million dollars so we could actually buy a place and do all the things that we want to do. We have uh, a video prepared. We have, uh, pretty much everything prepared. And um, I didn't do it. And the reason why I didn't do it is because uh, I knew that uh, there's something that's more important. Uh, believe it or not, something that's more important that came up, which is what we talked about last night. Uh, the uh, warning Am Yisrael, warning the world uh, about this missionary event that's uh, coming up in Florida uh, at the Boca Raton Synagogue. And I uh, figured that we really have to focus all of our energy and all of our time uh, to gather uh, all of the material and uh, do all of the necessary checks, make all the necessary phone calls, and uh, in so many words, put the uh, the the campaign uh, as a uh, in in the back uh, in the back seat. Um, but uh, you know, because we this is uh, God comes first, and you know, if Hashem wants us to uh, to get money, uh, we don't need a, a whole week. We we don't need two weeks. We need simply one second uh so uh because we still live in the physical world so with that being said we're gonna try to uh, uh get everything together and launch the campaign our biggest campaign of the year we're gonna try to raise four and a half million dollars uh so we can buy the building uh so we can open the yeshiva so we could open the synagogue so we could uh buy the sifret torah we could do a lot of the things that we want to do in this coming year uh, meaning in these coming months, we have uh, a lot of different uh, amazing projects. We also have uh, a few very, very big announcements coming up. And uh, uh, this monthly event is just the first step. We also have this uh, store, this Kiruv store. Baal Hashem is, uh, is really taking off. We're going to be adding products to it uh, in the next uh, probably a week or so. We're going to be adding USBs. Uh, to the store and probably some other things uh, and we're also working on a few other very very big things to add to the store Bezot Hashem. Uh, aside from that we're also working on uh, uh, bringing some serious people serious tzaddikim to this uh, new community that we're building um, so again as far as people always ask me the place where who what when it all really depends on the money uh, if we have a certain amount of money, we can go to one place. If we don't have a certain amount of money, then we go to a different place. Uh, it all really depends on the money. Uh, if people really uh, have the ability and have the interest, then this is the time where you make your, your biggest push. Uh, Baruch Hashem, there's a few donors uh, that are very committed uh, and, uh, and uh, don't have to get instructions from me or even reminders from me that they need to make donations. Uh, and they simply do it on their own. So uh, this four and a half million dollar campaign, uh, we already are at uh, ten percent of it, meaning we have a match of a half a million dollars, approximately a half a million dollar match uh, already. 
uh, that uh, we have committed to us. Uh, so, uh, so we really need people to really push and uh, do as much as possible to perhaps get all of your friends, family, anybody that uh, you can uh, get together to make this push and to try to get us to uh, raise as much money as possible. We have uh, at least a half a million dollars that uh, you know people are willing to commit if you know obviously if other people are also committing. So with that being said, this is going to be launched uh, uh, this week. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow or the next day, but uh, again, like I said, it was supposed to be uh, you know several days ago, but uh, there was something else that took priority. Uh, as everybody already knows, money is not the top priority in our organization. The top or top priority is Hashem. After that is everything else that we need to do, and Bezat Hashem will succeed. So with that being said, there's a lot of different ideas that um, that we can discuss uh, and uh, before your questions. And uh, really one of the things that I looked at, and I remember uh, having an uh, insight on it, uh, sort of a chidush on it some years ago, uh, is in this week's parashat, parashat Shmot, we're starting a new book, uh, we're starting the book of Exodus, we're starting the, uh, the extraordinary life of Moshe Rabbeinu, really the birth uh, or the next chapter in the birth of Am Yisrael, uh, our chapter, our, um, our book Sefer Shmot is a, uh, already from the beginning of the book, uh, gives us a, uh, an indication of what's going to be in it, uh, which is that we're going to have the Matan Torah uh, in uh, the book of Exodus. If you look at the, um, uh, the Gimat, the, uh, um, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, numerical uh, separation between the letters, between the letters uh, in the beginning of Sefer Shmot, and you go to the second word of the parasha, Ve'ele Shmot. Uh, you go to the Taf, and then you count 50 places. Uh, you get to Ve'yehuda, count 50 more places. You, go, you get to the word Yerech, and then you get uh, 50 more places. You get to the word Ahu, uh, spelling the word Torah. Torah. So why, you know, what's the, what's the uh, you know, you find the word Torah uh, without needing to use computers. Uh, to find you a Torah code. Uh, so what's so significant about this? It is a nice parperaot shel chokma. It's the uh, uh, seasonings of, of wisdom to show you that this particular uh, book starts with the uh, uh, with this particular uh, secret in it that is it's specifically fifty letter skips, not forty nine, not five, not six. It's fifty letters. Why? Because that's in essence. How, uh, how long it took us from the time we left Egypt to Mount Sinai to actually receive the Torah. From the time we left Egypt until Shavuot is 50 days, four, seven weeks plus one. So you have a, uh, you know, the, the Torah that we get in Sefer Shmot uh, as the uh, Torah code in the beginning of the parasha. Now, of course, we have the Torah, Baruch Hashem. It's the biggest gift that could ever be. Uh, to the world, uh, as the Zohar Kadosh says, Hakadosh Baruch Hu looked into the Torah ubara alma, and then he created the world. Meaning that Hashem used the Torah as a uh, as a blueprint to create to the world. And the Rambam writes that initially, when Hashem gave Moshe Rabbeinu the Torah, uh, he gave him everything until uh, the uh, uh, everything that was written in the Torah. But uh, this was given at Parashat Yitro. Now, at, until that moment, the Torah was all one big word, meaning all of the words, all of the letters were connected to each other. There was no separation. Everything was already written in the Torah, 974 generations before the world was created, as the Gemara in Masechet Chagiga uh, discusses. Uh, and the Rambam elaborates and says that how did this Torah be written before uh, creating the world and yet not write the narration of the story itself of what happened with Adam Arishon, what happened with Avraham, happened Yitzchak, Yaakov, the Shvatim, Moshe. I mean, if the story is already written, where's the free choice? 
What the free choice is, is that the Torah already had all of the information and all of the possibilities that could ever be from the beginning of the world to the end of the world about every single event, including this you, including your personal life, including every single thing that could ever be, is already instilled inside the Torah with those same exact letters that Hashem created at the beginning, 974 generations before He created the world. When He gave this book in essence uh to to moshe rabenu that those letters were all connected there was no separation between the letters and what hashem taught moshe rabenu at mount sinai is how to separate the letters where to separate them in order to create the words now this of course is only possible in the hebrew language it's only possible in the hebrew language because in the hebrew language we have both the the letters themselves and we also have a vowel system which is called nikud now in english and other languages their vowel system is typically the letters themselves it's not nikud now if you let's say for example you take a uh, uh the the word uh, moses okay which is uh, uh which is moshe uh in english uh if you take the word moses and you remove the vowels from it okay then what ends up happening is that you now have a completely different word you have mss because in uh, in english the vowels are the five letters a e i or u uh so and sometimes y so you have here a, a word completely change whereas in hebrew on the other hand if you change the vowels in the uh, the word moshe you could actually uh have the same exact spelling but end up having a different word even more so if you uh, let's say for example take a sentence uh in uh, in the hebrew language you combine the whole sentence and then you simply decide to separate the words in different places than the original sentence was what you will end up having many times that you'll have if you're talking about the biblical language not something that's from a newspaper uh, modern hebrew the biblical language you'll see that you're able to separate and make different words from that simple single sentence many many different words many many different sentences if you're using the torah itself is an unlimited amount of sentences that you come up with if you have the knowledge now this is in essence the knowledge that hashem gave moshe rabbeinu at mount sinai to separate those very same letters he didn't change the letters that were already written 974 generations before the world was created and he told him to separate them at different places in order to make certain words and to see and to make the narration that we have today now if you do the same thing in a uh, uh, uh in the english language you simply arrive at garbage you arrive at nothing uh you you won't be able to make up a single word uh you know or a single logical sound why because that's not the holy language it's uh, even though all of the languages uh were created by hashem this is at the uh, tower of babel hashem uh, uh, created the 70 different languages they all stem from hebrew originally but nonetheless the holy divine language is hebrew now the uh, the beautiful thing is is that although we have this holy torah although we have this uh, extraordinary stories of trials and tribulations of individuals of the nation itself we have it we have it in our hands already for over 3300 years that does not mean that just because you have it you know how to use it just because you have it you are using it and this is in essence one of the things that uh, we learned last night when we learned about Aaron Cohen Aaron Cohen that loved peace chased peace and brought Am Israel to the Torah the uh Tana the um, Avot Rabbi Natan says the reason why Aaron Cohen merited to uh become the Kohen Gadol uh rather than anybody else in the nation was because he did Kiruv he went from place to place from house to house looking for people that were ignorant of the Torah and teach and taught them Torah taught them Shema Yisrael taught them how to pray and this is much more than any uh, uh anyone in the world is doing today and Aaron Cohen, the Gdol Ador, was doing this. Now, you have here a generation that's called the generation of knowledge that literally saw the seven heavens, literally heard and saw the voice of God, but yet you still have ignorance among them uh, that uh, had to be corrected by individuals, now, nonetheless by uh, 
by Aaron Akoin himself. So the ignorance itself is not necessarily a new thing, uh, but uh, it's, it's not necessarily ignorance because the knowledge was not available, but rather because it was choice. We always have a choice. Another example of this is when we look at this week's parasha, we look at parashat Shemot, and we look at the whole uh, discussion uh, that took place between Moshe Rabbeinu and Akadosh Baruch Hu himself. For anybody that invests some time reading the Gemara, reading the Midrash Rabbah, especially the Midrash Rabbah in, in uh, Sefer uh, uh, Dvarim, the last parasha, Vezot Abracha, uh, you look at Avot Rabbi Natan, uh, discusses the, shows you the conversations between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Moshe Rabbeinu, and it's literally unbelievable that they had these discussions and they spoke uh, in such a way, like, like Hashem says, like one friend to another. The relationship between Moshe Rabbeinu and HaKadosh Baruch Hu was simply unsurpassed, unbelievable, and the discussions and the debates and everything that took place was truly unique and very beautiful. Even uh, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, took the neshama of Moshe Rabbeinu, even that they had a discussion and a debate about. But this all starts here. It starts in this week's parasha, Parashat Shemot, where HaKadosh Baruch Hu is, uh, calls out to, uh, to Moshe Rabbeinu, and uh, immediately Moshe Rabbeinu says, Hineni, Hineni, is a uh, the uh, the term that all of our forefathers used uh, to uh, to s- uh, symbolize that they are ready to go. They're ready to go anytime Hashem called to Avraham, to Yitzhak, to Yaakov. They said Hineni. The same concept with uh, when uh, 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 Avraham spoke to his son Yitzhak. He said Hineni. Hineni is in essence, I'm ready for task. I don't even need to know what you're going to tell me to do. I'm ready to go. Now, during this discussion that Hashem has with Moshe Rabbeinu, sending him to, uh, to bring back Am Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu is, in essence, telling uh, Hashem that perhaps he's not the right person to do it. Uh, maybe somebody else can do it. Perhaps they're not going to believe him. And really, he gives him uh, four different possibilities where Hashem tells him, he gives him a possibilities of how uh, Ami says is not going to believe him, and Hashem says, "Yes, there are four different possible choices of what could be." This is in uh, chapter four, uh, verse number eight uh, and on. And Hashem says, "Lo yaminu lach, velo yishmeu lekol haot harishon ולקחת ממה היאור ושפכת היבשה והיו המים אשר תיקח מן היאור והיו לדם ביבשת. So here the uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is uh, saying to, uh, to Moshe Rabbeinu It shall be that if they don't believe you and they don't heed your voice Here you have two possibilities Either they don't believe you, or they believe you, they just simply don't want to listen to you. They don't believe you, or they don't heed your voice for the first sign. They will believe the voice of the latter sign. That's a third possibility. And it shall be that if they don't believe, even these two signs, and do not heed your voice, meaning even after the third sign, they don't, they don't listen to that one either, then it shall, uh, you shall take uh, from the water of the river and pour it out on the dry land and the water that you shall take from the river will become blood when it is on the dry land in essence the fourth possibility is that they see the truth and that's in essence when they accept everything so here we see that the kadosh baruch Hu is very well aware of all of the possibilities just like we said before everything is already uh written in the torah uh to hashem the past the present and the future uh, is already known to him at present time. There is no difference between past, present, and future to him. Now you would ask yourself, it's a, uh, you know, how is it possible that I have free choice if uh, it's already written in the Torah? Well, that's because free choice doesn't limit your choice. You know, free choice allows you to pick whatever uh, whatever things you you want to do. Hashem does not interfere with your choices, but you still get to choose. The outcomes are innumerable. 
meaning that let's say if you choose a then b will happen if you choose b then c will happen if you choose c then d will happen if you choose d then e will happen and if and, and then after you get to those choices let's say you chose b and c happened once you got to c you're gonna make other choices and then you have again a and you'll b will happen b c will happen and so on and so forth so in essence in 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 Hashem's world in Hashem's reality which is uh impossible really for us to comprehend he already has all of those possibilities all of those choices being made in real time all of the outcomes of those choices and thereby all of the new possibilities the cause and effect of the decided choices and then thereby the new uh, uh outcomes of those new choices that are available to a infinite amount so this is something that is impossible for a human being to ever truly comprehend the format that i just explained it to you is probably uh going over some people's head but nonetheless it is a uh, to the best of my ability to explain to you how hashem already knows the future but also does not interfere with your present choice and this is one of the examples of how Hashem is already telling us. Tells Moshe Rabbeinu, yes, there are several possibilities here of them believing you or not believing you. They could not believe the first choice, but then believe the second choice. They could not believe the first and the second choice, but then they believe the uh, third choice. They could not believe the first choice, the second choice, uh, but uh, and then simply not listen to them uh, to even after believing. And so there's multiple possibilities here. The question is, after everything we've just done, this whole shakshuka, this whole salad that that, that we just made, uh, what 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 do we really learn from here? We learn from here, Rabbi that despite having the holy Torah, it doesn't necessarily always mean that you know people make the right decisions and follow what the Torah says. So one of the things that uh, I uh, I want to go over today is just to go through. How do we get to that discussion with Moshe Rabbeinu? And why did Moshe Rabbeinu finally decide that, okay, I'm going to go forward with it? What was holding him back in the first place? If you're already telling me that you're God and you're sending me to task, why am I doubting you myself? Is Moshe Rabbeinu really doubting Hashem? Obviously, the answer is no. So what's really behind this whole discussion what's the point you're telling Hashem oh they're they're not maybe they're not going to listen to me you think that Hashem doesn't know that obviously Moshe Rabbeinu knows that Hashem knows that in essence we're going to try to get to the root of all of it and let's see how this could also apply to our life because we already know that in the beginning of this uh of this uh uh Sefer Shmot we already have secrets within the words let's just see what we have in the words themselves in the beginning of the parasha we already learned about how there is a law within the world within the nature of the world that Hashem instituted that is called a Sav Soneit Yaakov a Sav Soneit Yaakov is a uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai Paskins this Alakha that a Sav hates Yaakov now of course this typically the simple meaning of it is that there is a uh, uh deep rooted hatred between a dome and the Jewish people that Hashem turns on and off uh at different times sometimes he turns it on in order to hit us sometimes he turns it on in order to direct us uh just like he tells uh David the Melech that uh you know sometimes it's the stick sometimes it's the staff either way Hashem uses the Edom for that but he also uses Ishmael he also uses Ishmael to do similar things but nonetheless we see that this anti-semitism that there is innumerable amount of money and publicity uh, about on a daily basis is not a new issue and will never be resolved until Mashiach comes why this is part of the nature of the world that Hashem created and it's one of the tools that Hashem uses in order to bring us to a certain place that we need to be either to bring us to a place of tshuva or to bring us to the ultimate salvation or or whatever it is but we see that this particular 
uh, anti-Semitism is not for one to understand. And quite frankly, the people that are trying to uh, create peace in the Middle East and create uh, less anti-Semitism in the world, if they really believe that they're going to create, you know, uh, uh, less anti-Semitism, then that simply means they never actually really learned Torah. Why? Because anti-Semitism is simply a law in nature that Hashem himself instituted. No different than gravity, uh, no different than the different physics uh, that are, uh, that we have to deal with on a regular basis. All types of things. Anti-Semitism is not something that makes sense. Anti-Semitism is not something that we look forward to. But nonetheless, we have to know that this is indeed part of the nature of this world and we have to learn how to look at anti-semitism and utilize that in order for us to get closer to hashem when there is increased anti-semitism that means that the message from hashem is stronger for us to do tshuva for us to fix our ways for us to do different things not for us to do protests not for us to uh, make all types of public campaigns to uh, tell people to stop this is all complete stupidity and a waste of money but unfortunately if people do not look at the past they have no concept whatsoever of what's going to be in the future and they're going to keep chasing their tail making new campaigns and new organizations that pretend to solve the problem called anti-semitism now where do we see this first we see this in sefer shemot where after yosef Tzadik built egypt and got it to the top of the top place in the world as far as it became the world power financially and otherwise suddenly you have a a a extraordinary blessing that comes to uh to uh uh, the the family of Yaakov Avinu to the Israelites where it says Hashem blessed the uh, children of Israel to be fruitful teamed increased became strong very very much and the land filled with them so Chachamim teaches why is Hashem using so many adjectives to describe the blessing that he put on the 70 uh, people 70 neshamot that came to Egypt from the uh, family of Yaakov and the reason why is because you want this is a symbolic of the miracle that happened that from that moment on every woman that would give birth would give birth to six babies that's so the six adjectives symbolizing every birth six babies so in essence the average family has you know they're getting married relatively young she'll have let's say 10 births by the time she's 35 40 years old she already has 10 births you have 60 kids with so many words by the time you finish cooking breakfast you're already at lunch by the time everybody tells you what they want to eat for lunch, you already have to prepare dinner. Uh, it's a, I mean, you have, every family has an extraordinary amount of kids, and this was one of the blessings. Now, of course, in today's society, people are scared of having many kids because they, uh, they, they love themselves too much and not realize that kids are a blessing. But nonetheless, uh, the, uh, the blessing here was that you had many kids. Now, if you have people that are, uh you know uh, just you know uh, take everything for granted they don't produce anything and they're constantly reproducing and they're just taking money from welfare and they're not working and they're not productive and they're criminals and they're losers and they're drug addicts then of course you wouldn't want this but this is not the jewish people this is not the israelites we were the ones that uh, Akadosh Baruch Hu instilled certain wisdom in since the beginning of creation. And of course, we've always been productive. One of the ways is we see in Egypt, Egypt got to where it was uh, due to the uh, ideas and the leadership of Yosef HaTzadik. So now that you have a uh, more blessing where more of those uh, extraordinary people are coming to the country, you would think this would be a uh, happy moment for the Egyptians. There's more Yosefs. The original uh, uh, Paro was excited when he heard that uh, Yosef had brothers. He said, well, look, one of them pretty much built my whole country to what it is. Now I have another, another 69 more of them. This is fantastic. So he was ecstatic that uh, Yosef's family came, especially when he found out that they are a royal family 
because that in essence justified his original decision to make yourself a viceroy the point being is that the original the original idea of having jews as part of the of the people was great so now hashem fulfilled in essence their prayer you prayed for more here you go every uh uh part of the uh, uh israelites is now going to have six more babies every birth six babies six babies six babies every year you have another uh you know 100 200 people added in uh in, in every uh, in every group in every neighborhood so this turned into millions millions and millions of israelites where they were all over the land of israel and then we see the first point that doesn't make any sense a new king arose over egypt who did not know yosef how could you not know yosef this is like saying a person that lives in america doesn't know who george washington is or abraham lincoln I mean, if you don't know who Obama is or you don't know who uh, Biden is, okay, maybe you're a little ignorant about current politics. But uh, perhaps, uh, you know, if you live in this country, you should know who are the so-called founding fathers. Same thing if you, uh, you know, if you work for a major corporation and you don't know who's the founder of the company, it's a, uh, you know, it is, it is definitely a, uh, a flaw. It's a flaw. One of the worst things in the world is when somebody... Uh, works for you and asks you com- questions about your company that he should be able or she should be able to find out on their own you know so the point is is that when somebody is truly uh you know cares about a situation they make it their business to find out this information which means that if somebody got to the highest position and doesn't know who built this place there's something wrong here so how could it be that Paro, the new Paro, the Melech Hadash, the new king doesn't know who Yosef is. So Chachamim teaches not that he doesn't know who Yosef is, he doesn't want to know who Yosef is. He wants to forget this. Why? Because a Kadosh Baruch Hu, in essence put a bug in his head saying, okay, anti-Semitism has to turn on the turn on the switch. Turn on the switch. Start doing a bunch of things that don't make any sense. First and foremost, pretend as if Yosef was a nobody. He made a bunch of mistakes. Really, he's the one that took took advantage of us. We didn't benefit out of it. All types of mumbo jumbo that happens in today's world of media on a regular basis, where everybody that ever did a, you know any good, if they get on the wrong uh, on the wrong uh, 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 side of anybody that's uh, currently important, what people do is just simply destroy them. So you see, here this is uh, Paro is doing the same thing. All of a sudden, he doesn't know who Yosef is. Then he says something that completely doesn't make sense, very common to how today's anti-Semitism works, where he says, uh, says, let's outsmart it. This, this uh, children of Israel, the two numerous let's outsmart them why why should we outsmart them because then if a uh we should have to, we have to be careful because if a war starts they're probably going to join the enemies and war, wage war against us hold on a second did you ever see any of them pick up any weapons and kill anybody is there a high murder rate in the jewish neighborhood is there a uh is the police even go there to bother with anything no the israelites the jewish people thereby are known to be generally speaking very calm and for all intents and purposes we don't really attack anybody now of course the media especially the liberal lefty media the uh, the pro-palestinian pro-terrorist type of media will always tell you the opposite that we uh you know we're attacking everybody we are uh you know uh, in a land that doesn't belong to us and all types of other nonsense but in reality anyone that actually truly looks at history we see that whether it's modern day israel or it's the jewish people in general even more so throughout all of history we t- we don't attack we don't attack anybody we defend ourselves if if we have the ability to but we don't attack but here we're living in peace we're helping uh egypt build the country and this guy says oh listen 
Uh, they, they're so many they're so big they're like we have to outsmart them and uh in case there's a war why because if a war comes they're gonna join the enemy now why doesn't this make any sense aside from the fact that the jewish people are not violent people because if i live here why would i attack you the point being here is that if i live here if let's say for example we're living in america now if iran decides decides you know what we're gonna go fight america do you think the Jewish people are going to join Iran? No, nobody would that has a brain cell in their head will say, you know what? If Iran or China or Russia or any of these countries that can't stand America decides to attack America, yeah, the Jews are going to go fight America. No one in their right mind thinks such a stupid idea. But that's anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism doesn't make any sense. In essence, it's one of Hashem's ways to show you that this anti-Semitism is a supernatural thing. It's a mystical thing. It's something that is, in essence, directed by heaven. Not a, this is not absolving anybody from uh, you know, their crimes of being anti-Semitic. This is simply showing the Jewish people that don't spend your time and effort trying to solve the uh, Jewish uh, problem in people's head. Try to solve the Torah problem that we have which is there's not enough people to learn torah not enough people that are doing the will of hashem there's a lot of people that are distorting the torah there's a lot of people that are going against the torah that is what you have to resolve not the anti-semitic problem but here we see that these people in egypt are saying no they're uh they're smart they're uh you know they're numerous we have to outsmart them because if there's a war they're gonna join our enemies which again doesn't make any sense in the world not just about the Jewish view, about any nation. If you go to any country in the world, you're not going to say, listen, if, uh, I don't know, let's say you, you have a lot of Muslims in France, okay? Now, if, let's say, China decides to attack France, hypothetically speaking, the Muslim people in France are not going to join the Chinese people. It's just not going to happen. Why? Why? If anything, they're going to join the French people that are hosting them, even though they're already become the majority there, and they're going to fight the Chinese people. Why? Because they live there. So the whole concept here is something that shows us anti-Semitism is something that's not supposed to make sense. When you're trying to make sense of it, it's actually a problem. Why? You're in essence using what's called kohi ve'otsem yadi. My power, my strength is going to resolve this problem. And even Shimshon Agibo, Shimshon Agibo, the Gemara, uh, in Masechet Sota, says that he was a Navi, he was Kodesh Kodeshim, he was, uh, there was a, the Shechina would walk in front of them, uh, when, in front of Shimshon, uh, to the point where anywhere it would walk, there would be like bells, as if they, 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 there's a uh, uh, kinghood and majesty walking together with Shimshon. Shimshon was a very, very holy person. Uh, you know, of course, people know Shimshon, uh, as uh, you know from the movies where they see this guy with a lot of muscles they don't realize that there's an opinion that Gemara says that he was a paraplegic he didn't, uh, his legs didn't work uh, his, all of his power was spiritual power and after he took uh, a, uh, a, uh, the cheek of a, um, a jawbone of a uh, donkey and killed a thousand Philistines he made one wrong sentence one wrong steam he said I killed these Philistines that second you look at the uh in the uh in the chumash in the tanakh you'll see that second he became thirsty to the point of unbearable so like he became paralyzed from the amount of thirst that he had he couldn't move he couldn't get himself up he couldn't pick up a bottle of anything and he at that point hashem showed him where did you get this power to kill the phil you killed the philistines or i killed the philistines and the uh, and Shimshon said to Hashem, "Please, Hashem, I just you know uh, you you just made a miracle for me to kill all these Philistines. Now I'm gonna die from thirst." So Hashem made another miracle and made a well of a uh, um, a spring of water, a spring of fresh water come out of his tooth, because he wanted to make another extra supernatural miracle. He could have easily just given him his strength back, but he wanted to show Shimshon that I decide when you win, when you lose, when you have power, when you don't have power, and even when you drink and how you drink. To show Shimshon that the second a person 
starts taking credit for themselves they're already going in the wrong direction they're already going in the wrong direction so here we see that the Egyptians wanted to take credit for the uh the uh, all the success and they thought that the uh the children of israel were getting in the way and perhaps they're gonna go against them and they're gonna join the enemy but then there's another point that doesn't make any sense what's the uh what's the other point that make any sense if you're afraid that these people really are going to go against you in case there is a uh an enemy comes and attacks you why don't you just tell them leave get out of here we don't want any more uh, jews in the country no the opposite the opposite the it says here to go up with the land rashi says that they did not want the jewish people they did not want the children of israel to leave egypt why they were too beneficial to the egyptian economy to afford to be able to lose them so on one hand you're saying they are the enemy we have to fool them because if the enemy attacks us they're going to join the enemy on the other hand you want to keep them you don't want to let them leave obviously again everything contradicts itself now this is very similar to how what happened in uh, nazi germany nazi germany said they hated jews uh, hitler imach shimo and his mein kampf uh, wrote about how uh, he wanted to uh, destroy the jewish people he uh, thought all types of horrific things about them but when it came to releasing the jewish people and saying you know what get out of here of course some of the jews refused to leave because they viewed themselves as germans but even the jews that wanted to leave weren't necessarily allowed to leave in peace to take everything there everything had to be like a deal if you hate us so much let us leave with everything and even entice us to leave but that's the thing that's the contradiction that's in essence where Hashem shows you that when it comes to anti-semitism this is some, one of the tools that Hashem himself created in order to use it as a staff a staff or a stick to direct his people now further we see that the uh similar to what's happening uh today in the world that uh one of the ways that uh the egyptians started causing problems for us is that that they appointed taskmasters people collecting taxes collecting money this is similar to people that are causing problems for the jewish people politically whether it's the uh the politicians or even the self-hating jews like this organization called yafid uh, that uh, we mentioned uh, uh running by that's run by some fake uh, uh orthodox jew he calls himself uh named monster i call him monster because uh, this guy goes to the government and tells them that the yeshiva system the jewish yeshiva system needs to be uh, uh restructured and uh they need to teach they need to force the uh, yeshiva system to teach more secular studies so this so-called jew goes to the gentiles and tells them to institute laws to force the jewish yeshivas to teach non-jewish material even though we already do he has a mission with his uh heretical organization to cause problems this is again one of the tools of Hashem now of course the people that uh, Hashem uses as the stick to hit us are going to get punished because they choose to be those tools they don't have to be those tools once somebody chooses to to be bad Hashem uses them for bad once somebody uses you know chooses to be good Hashem uses them for good so people get reward and punishment based on their choices but Hashem still manipulates the world and uses their choices for them to to do whatever it is that they want so the people from Yafid the people from one for Israel the people from all of these different types of organizations that are uh, causing harm to the Jewish people surely they're all going to get punished but this is again one of the things that happened in Egypt that they instituted 
all types of taskmasters in order to afflict us causes burdens causes problems and Hashem in essence is making the time at at, uh, Egypt much much worse why is Hashem doing all of this why is Hashem doing all of this now first off we know that Hashem already decreed that Amisa will be in Egypt he already told Avram that it's going to be but the uh the big thing is that the reason why things got much much worse is because the original decree was that we we're supposed to be in Egypt for 400 years and Hashem wanted to shorten it Hashem wanted to bring the salvation faster Hashem wanted to bring the salvation faster so why did he decide this time because Moshe Rabbeinu was born Moshe Rabbeinu was the first one that was ever willing to sacrifice his life for the sake of Am Yisrael to that extent and therefore it was the uh, decree to be the uh, the uh, the Mashiach that's going to bring the salvation to Am Yisrael and take us out of Egypt bring us in and, and get us the Torah and so on now the question is how come there isn't a bunch of Moshe's how come there isn't six Moshe's and six Aaron and six Miriam because we learned in the beginning of the parasha what do we learn every birth was six so how come there's not how come there's only Moshe Aaron and, and Miriam they're all siblings how come there's not more brothers the more siblings this is actually uh we see that um in verse in chapter one of uh, book of exodus verse number 12 it says where it says that uh as much uh as they were afflicted it so it would increase and so it would spread out meaning that the more they afflicted the children of israel the more Hashem miraculously increased the number of uh, of, of birth, increased the number of, uh, of of Israelites in the world. So, in essence, it actually supports the belief that there should be, at the very least, six Moshe Rabenus, six Aarons. How come there isn't? The answer to that, you have to go to Genesis chapter forty-seven, verse twenty-two. In Genesis chapter forty-seven, verse twenty-two, you'll find that. Yosef at Sadiq already prophetically made a law. What is the law? That only the land of the priest he did not buy, that Yosef didn't buy, since the priest had a stipend from Paro and they lived off of their stipend. Now, why, why, why what is this, uh, what is this whole uh, arrangement that Yosef made a law prophetically he knew that this was already told to his uh, great-grandfather to Avram Avinu that the Jewish people are going to go to Egypt he knew that all of this is going to materialize in a certain way and uh, there uh, it's going to be suffering and so on but you have to already Hashem has to prepare the cure before the ailment so how so we have to make sure that the saviors are going to have the freedom to save how can we do such a thing one step is to make sure that we make this law that the people that are Kwanim, the people that are the people of the religion are going to be free but how can you do it you make the law for the egyptians anyone that's an egyptian priest doesn't have to pay the taxes doesn't have to uh worry about uh the monetary issues why because they're under the uh uh uh, the uh uh the umbrella of the government itself and that's why after the, even though everybody in Egypt that was dealing with the famine had to uh, sell their land sell their animals sell their everything this verse says that uh, Yosef did not buy uh, anything from uh, the priest because they were getting a stipend from Pro. they had a special rule now this law was instituted not just for the Egyptians but anybody of religion and who was anybody of religion the levy tribe the levy tribe were the only ones that did not fall for the trap of paro and join his workforce when he told everybody listen let's be patriotic 
let's say uh, rebuild Egypt even more let's take it uh you know let's uh, let's make it good again you know like uh the the uh, the leaders of today when they go on campaign let's uh, let's uh, let's build uh, America again let's build Russia again let's build everything again and they try to get everybody uh in it and Rashi says that Paro even went into the land and started digging as if he is going to be one of the employees along with the people this was in essence just to entice people to shut down their businesses the uh and to join him so all of the Israelites that were offered a lot of money shut down their businesses and joined Paro and started working before you know it the salary that he promised them was cut in half and before and they still continued before you know it that salary was cut in half before you know it that salary was cut in half and before you know it eventually they became slaves and that's what he meant when he said let's fool them let's fool them into becoming our slaves how can you fool somebody into becoming a slave first offer him even more than what he has right now offer him more than what he has right now once he leaves what he has and he becomes dependent on us then we can manipulate things as much as we want little by little it will offer him a little less than what it was and i'll still say it's okay because it's still more than what he had and a little less and even though it's what he had he's not gonna go back and then a little less and even though it's less than what he had he can't really go back to what he had because he already it's already destroyed it's already gone he would have to rebuild and he doesn't want to do it so and little by little they lowered 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 the salary until they all became slaves so now the suffering the problems continue to increase and the people continue to increase meaning that in the eyes in the perspective of the Egyptians this wasn't being resolved even though they're causing them harm they're turning everybody into slaves still there's a lot of Jews there's still a lot of problems here what's going on so one of the ways that Hashem sent the salvation is that he made that there's a rule that was already passed 200 years before this whole thing happened that anybody that's of religion was not going to uh, uh, be subject to these different rules and policies in, in the country of, uh, of Egypt. And the Levi tribe was the only ones that did not join Pao. When he offered them all this money to join his workforce, they were the only ones that didn't comply. Why? They were studying in the Kolel. They were learning Torah. They said, we're, we're not involved in, the, uh, in that world anyway. We make whatever we need to make. We do whatever we need to do. We need to have freedom to learn Torah as much as we can. We're not really interested in making more money. And that, in essence, saved them. And that's why uh, they, uh, they did not suffer the slavery. And that answers our question of why isn't there six Aaron or six Moshe or six Miriam? Because that six blessing was to who? Was to the people that suffered, the people that were slaves. And since Aaron and Miriam and, uh, and Amram and Yochebed, they were not slaves. Since they weren't slaves, they didn't have the blessing of having every birth being sixfold. So that's one, one particular thing. Now, one of the things that Miriam had to, uh, had to do is she worked for the king. She worked for Paro. Her and, uh, her, and her mom, Yochevet, they worked for, for Paro as the Meyaldot, the, uh, the, uh, um, the woman that would uh, you know, deliver the, the babies, the midwives. So now... This is also explains that there is a uh, prophetic uh, 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 verse here as well. That of course nobody that learns the verses literally could ever find this because you simply uh, you have to learn you know the, the the commentaries. You have to learn how to learn to. Uh, uh, so in the in the world of the uh, uh, heretics, the world of the uh, Christians, the word of the all of those people, none of the stuff that I'm telling you right now is uh is, is known to them simply because they read the torah like they read a newspaper so this is also one of the one of the reasons why i'm doing this is to show you how you have to have the commentary by the sages in order to know how to connect the pieces in order to make sense of everything so the uh why did the uh uh Yochevet, the mother of moshe and Miriam, uh get such a fantastic job of working for pharaoh because again they were part of the religious family that had special rules they weren't slaves that's why they were able to talk to paro in such a fashion now when paro told them you have to kill all the babies if he was telling it to one of the other slaves he would be afraid to tell them 
because they would tell the other slaves but he was telling somebody in essence that was like one of his employees one of his executives even though they were part of the hebrews because they were like a uh, a special family so now this uh Yochevet and uh miriam don't listen to paro because they have fear of heaven they have yirat shemaim and uh but when they have to answer the uh the question what's going on why didn't you do what i said they said no the uh the midwife said to paro this is uh, shifra and pua that uh because the hebrew women are unlike the egyptian women for their experts before the midwives come to them they have already given birth so the uh Chachamim say why do the uh why do the uh, uh midwives call the uh the hebrew women like chayot chayot is animals why are they calling them chayot they're in english translation it says experts but in reality it says chayot chayot means uh, animals why because this too was also known to the family of Yaakov Avinu where uh when he gave the blessing to Dan when he gave the blessing to Dan in uh, chapter 49 verse 17 what blessing did he give to Dan he told Dan Dan Yedin Amo Keachad Shiftin Yisrael Yidan Nachash Ale Derech that he says that uh, Dan will avenge his people the tribes of Israel will be united as one Dan will be a serpent on the highway why a serpent why a serpent why he's gonna be a chaya he's gonna be an animal yes we need two special people to tell the future leadership that's going to try to kill us that the Jewish people are like chayot they're like snakes they give birth by themselves they don't need anybody to take uh, take the uh, eggs out that's going to be a tool that is going to save who are these uh, special women Yochevet and her daughter Miriam Yochevet and her daughter Miriam are going to do it but they're only going to do it if they have fear of heaven and they're more afraid of Hashem than they are afraid of the uh the king that's of uh, flesh and blood and what did they end up meriting for listening to Hashem by actually fulfilling this prophecy that was already told to uh their great 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 grandfather or uh, uh grandfather's brother what do they actually uh, uh uh get as a result they ended up getting houses what does it mean houses they get special villas three floors five kitchens what, what do they get no houses meaning they got a uh um uh they got a, a special family special family ancestry where from uh, Miriam which was Pua came David the Melech Gemara Masechet Sota page 11b and uh, for, of course Yochevet uh was a uh was the mother of both the Kohanim and the Levites so due to the fact that they uh fulfilled the uh, the words of the uh, uh their forefathers they're in essence the sages they uh they got blessing that they became part of the lineage itself so we see here that when we follow the instructions despite the difficulty that's in the world a person that's listening to the words of Torah will have special protection the people that that listen to the words of the commercials the words of the bank account the words of their desire will not have that same protection will not have that same protection now Paro tried to do whatever he could in order to kill this person that's going to eventually take uh, take him down because his necromancers told him that there's going to be somebody born to the uh to the uh children of Israel that will take you down so that's why he instituted this new rule that every uh, woman that has a, a baby boy throw him into the water kill him of course the uh Midrash tells us that every time the Egyptians 
threw the uh, the babies into the water an angel would collect those babies and take them to a special place feed them and take care of them until they're three years old and that baby would uh you know they'll be inside caves and then that baby would grow up to three years old and come back to their parents knowing exactly who their parents are miraculously and uh, they would uh eat uh they'll take a rock that of course Hashem uh, miraculously turned into their food source there would be honey coming from that rock and milk coming from that rock so in essence Hashem changed nature in order to save these uh these particular babies but there was a special baby that Paro was looking for and to show Paro to show Paro that it doesn't matter how many idols he prays to it doesn't matter how powerful he is Hashem specifically punished Paro in a unique fashion with a special touch that very same baby that you're trying to kill everybody for just to go find him not only will you not kill him but you will end up raising him in your house and that's exactly what happened that very same baby he was looking for and was killing you know uh, millions of, of babies as a result just to, to to make sure that no baby boy is uh, is born and then takes his position Hashem said that very boy you're gonna end up raising him and Hashem obviously the whole story of how uh Yochevet put him in a basket and uh, Batya this daughter of Paro that was a big tzadika found him adopted him and in essence uh, Paro uh, ended up himself falling in love with this little boy now the uh Paro ended up raising Moshe in order to teach us that Rabot Machshavot Belev Ish Ve'etzat Hashem Itakum Shlomo HaMelech says that there are many thoughts in the uh, heart of man but only the uh, 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 the uh, decision of Hashem will be implemented we have a lot of uh, ideas we have a lot of feelings of which things uh, need to happen and you can do whatever you want you have the free choice to decide whatever it is that you want but as far as the outcome as we've already said in many other shulim the outcome is only decided by Hashem the outcome is decided by Hashem you can decide to work you can decide to learn you can decide to uh this you can decide to do that now you are deciding it because you are assuming a certain outcome Hashem is going to decide that outcome though meaning that your your decision to do one thing or the other is based on a false premise that a certain outcome is assured to you if you do certain things now if a person does the will of Hashem then yes there is a rule that says that Hashem uh, uh, rewards the uh, righteous and punishes the wicked but that doesn't mean that he rewards them right away and he rewards them even uh in in this world in the way that you would think that you would get rewarded Hashem has his own unique ways of doing everything that he does but when a person makes their decisions in such a fashion where I'm gonna go build this I'm gonna go buy this I'm gonna go work on this I'm gonna do anything because I want to get this outcome that's in essence a decision based on a false premise the false premise that you are correct with what will happen as a result of your work and a lot of the almost practically all self-help uh type of uh uh gurus and 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 uh and uh uh, advice people that's in essence what they teach now although there is a lot of good that could happen from uh, uh, you know being productive and being ambitious and a person should always aim higher a person should never think for a moment that their results that they assume are what's guaranteed to them uh, that's that's a mistake that's a mistake and in fact even if they say listen but I did it before and it worked doesn't mean anything doesn't mean anything past performance is no indication of future results so when a person understands that Hashem is the only one that decides what the outcome is going to be in any particular action that you do already a person is going to decide differently decide differently which action to take with having Hashem in mind in their decision meaning that I want to go work for this because I want to make a lot of money great but since I know that Hashem is going to decide whether I make a lot of money or not it doesn't matter if that company is offering me a lot of money why because I could go sign a contract they get me uh the job that's going to give me a lot of money but if Hashem doesn't want me to have a lot of money I'll simply send some type of uh 
a criminal to steal all that money from me and I end up with zero. Or uh, the, uh, the IRS will make a, pro- make a mistake and simply wipe out my account because they mistake me instead of somebody else that has the same name. Or all types of other things that Hashem can do. So, Rabot Machshavot Belevish Ve'etzat Hashem Itakum. There's a lot of uh, uh, thoughts in the heart of a man, but only what Hashem decides will end up happening. So that means that when I decide to do something, if I have Hashem in mind, that decision is automatically different. Why? Because I still want to make a lot of money, but now I'm not going to decide to go work for such and such place just because of the money. I have to decide, is this place going to conflict with my servitude of Hashem? Are they going to allow me to observe Shabbat? Are they going to allow me to observe the Jewish holidays? Are they uh, full of uh, immodesty and immorality? Is the business kosher according to Da'at Torah? Meaning, I'm going to start asking myself questions that are not in a typical job interview. Why? Because your typical job interview is just simply going to tell you, you do X, Y, Z, you'll get X, Y, Z money. So if I'm thinking as if my decision will lead to a certain outcome, then I am just like everybody else, and I end up like everybody else simply confused not knowing why what i did ended up with a certain result on the other hand if i think like a jew then i decide things based on what it is in accordance to the torah whether it agrees or disagrees with the torah i go i still want to have ambition i still want to succeed i still want to do all of those things but i have some questions that are much more important than all of the other things around it doesn't negate it it doesn't eliminate it i still if i'm gonna work i want to be the best at work if i'm gonna go uh sell i still want to be the best salesman if i'm going to build i want to be the best builder so whatever it is that i want to do i still want to do the best but is the torah agreeing with this particular strategy how do i know i simply ask the right questions i ask the right questions if this particular job is going to conflict with my observance of torah this in essence is what would have resolved and is resolving the dilemma the inner dilemma that a lot of people are having with all types of unethical businesses that they're in a lot of guys that uh uh, connect to me ask me questions about the cash advance business a lot of religious guys unfortunately are in the cash advance business thinking that, listen, this is a great way to make a lot of money without having degrees, without having really much skill set, without having really anything, and you could simply make a lot of money in a short period of time. Great, you could also lose Olamaba. You could also go to Ganom forever. You could also become uh, one of the things that is going to give Hashem a reason to turn the anti-Semitic button on and give power to Amalek, as Rashi says. And I've discussed all of this in different shiurim. Now, how, why is all of this? Because that job, that career, that industry, and anything like it is against the Torah. So, of course, people that don't believe in the Torah, 100% or even at all, they'll contact me and they'll try to disagree. It's like, no, I disagree with what you say. Great, disagree. I don't care. You disagree or don't disagree. That's not how the world works, and it's definitely not how the Torah world works. You can't just say, I disagree with what you said. doesn't mean anything. In order to disagree, you have to have a basis, meaning you have to have supporting evidence for whatever you're doing. In one case, if let's say, for example, somebody tells me I have a fantastic investment. Okay, great. I know about investments. I've been investing for over two decades. Great. Fantastic. Oh, hold on a second, uh, Mr. Ruben. Before you invest with this guy, I want you to invest with me. Why do I, why should I invest with you? My investment is better. Why? No, it's just better. Now, if, if that's the response you're going to give, I'm going to say, listen, you know that? You see that door over there? Yeah, get out. Why? Because you're wasting my time. What do you mean it's better? What am I, a child? You have to show me why it's better. Why is this better than the other one? He said, this is good. I looked at the information and I decided it's good. You're saying yours is better. Based on what? Based on your words, the air that's coming out of your, your, your mouth with some voice attached to it? What makes it better? Does it have better value, better product, better potential, better this, better that? You can't just decide it's better. You have to show me evidence. 
Now, of course, every normal person on planet Earth understands everything I just said now. But for whatever reason or another, when it comes to Torah, almost nobody understands. Why? Because it conflicts with their inner desire. When I tell them, listen, you can't just say, I disagree with what you said in that Shiul Torah when you said that cash advance is not allowed. Or when you said that Mechalel Shabbat gets death penalty and, and whatever it is that we say in a Shulim. I disagree. You can't just say I disagree. You have to give supporting evidence for what justif- justifies your disagreement. Do you have better sources that in essence are saying what you want them to say if you don't then simply take that disagreement put it in a you know write it on a piece of paper crumble that piece of paper send it to the company tesla tell those company at tesla to give it to elon musk tell elon musk put it on the next rocket and shoot it up to space maybe one of the angels will get it from you and perhaps answer your question because nobody else on planet earth can help you disagreeing is not going to help you in the torah world you have to have a basis for what is justifying your disagreement for anything. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that their thoughts will lead to certain results. Rabot machshavot belev ish ve'etzat Hashem itakum. A lot of thoughts are in your mind, in your heart, but only the uh, decision of Hashem is going to make, decide the uh, uh, what's going to end up happening. Now, when part of the Jewish people, part of the uh, uh, the children of Israel decided to do the will of Hashem, they saved themselves from slavery. They, in essence, lived a excluded life despite the Holocaust that surrounded them. On the other hand, you have a bunch of people that chased money. They fell into the Holocaust of Egypt. In fact, anyone that reads the Midrashim sees that the Holocaust of Egypt was much worse than the Holocaust of Germany. But now... They saw this, and yet we have one of the righteous people, the most righteous, Moshe Rabbeinu, giving us two major issues. One, he's debating with Hashem. Should I save these people? Because since he was young, he saw that Am Yisrael is, is, is suffering. Since uh, uh, Moshe grew up, he went to his brethren, he observed their burden. He saw them suffering his whole life. He was crying for Ami his whole life. He would go pretend to be one of the slaves to help them, even though he was living in a, in a palace of Paro. On the other hand, after he saves the, uh, the Jew from the Egyptian killing him, those same Jews go and fight each other, and Moshe tries to break it up, and then they tell him, who do you think you are? And it says, Moshe, So Moshe was frightened from this, and he thought the matter indeed the matter is known. What matter is known? That these two people are bad? That's why there's a few extra words in the Torah. So to answer to all of this is the following. When someone is going in the way of Torah, then as long as they stick to the Torah every path in their life will always have an answer not immediate but eventually now Moshe Rabbeinu had a path in his life he had a journey in his life he saw that he was gifted came from a special family his father is one of the four people that never sinned and he understood that he has a special position in the world and he worked on himself to be the person that he became but he never saw himself as a leader he simply saw himself as someone that had the potential to do a lot and he did the best that he could Moshe Rabbeinu suffered with the people he felt their pain he worked with them he was willing to die for them Hashem chose Moshe Rabbeinu and not anybody else because nobody else was willing to die for Am Yisrael because nobody else felt the pain of Am Yisrael. Even though there were other righteous people, they didn't feel the pain of Am Yisrael like Moshe Rabbeinu did. So when Moshe Rabbeinu saw that the Egyptian was trying to kill the Jew, he simply couldn't handle it because he saw that this was injustice. That very same Egyptian, Imach Shimo, raped that Jew's wife 
the night before and since the jew walked in on him in essence he wanted to kill the jew because he was embarrassed moshe rabbeinu saw this with ruach HaKodesh, saw that the egyptian was not only the rapist but also now trying to become a murderer too and simply couldn't handle this pain of his fellow jew and he ended up killing the egyptian so how come the next day when Moshe Rabbeinu saw that Jew fighting his brother-in-law, this was the Tanan Aviram, and they rebuked Moshe instead. He said, he got scared, and he says, now this is known. What's known? Moshe Rabbeinu, when he saw that despite the fact that he saved that Jew's life, that Jew was ungrateful. Despite the fact that he was doing everything possible to save all of the Jewish people's life, the average person did not see this as a benefit. The average person was not showing any gratitude. Moshe Rabbeinu, so now I know why they're all slaves. Because although I feel their pain, although I see their suffering, although I didn't really understand why Hashem decided to make him slaves and I just figured that's because Hashem decreed it already at the time of Avram but why them why not somebody else why not wicked people they all look righteous to me once he saw that the character trait of gratitude is missing from the people he says this in itself justifies everything meaning that Hashem distastes hates lack of gratitude so much that this in itself justified the suffering that happened to many of the people at that time this is a personal rebuke for all of us today to ask ourselves are we grateful enough first and foremost are we grateful enough to Hashem for all that he gives us he gives you a husband gives you a wife gives you children gives you money gives you food gives you health gives you whatever he gives you do we say thank you properly or do we just complain all the time many people are very quick to complain but it's almost impossible for them to say thank you very quick to see something wrong but almost impossible for them to give a compliment one of the ways you can see that is in social media you see Uh, we come out with a new movie we come out with a new video you'll see that there is a of course some decent people that say oh this is great but it's always like somebody that's like a you know like uh, on depression at all times and finds a something wrong in everything oh i don't like the music in this video oh i don't think that you were right you said it's rashi but really it's rabbinu tam three hour of words he decides there was one word that disagreed that's it now if that very same person or persons would give just as much compliments as they do complaints you know what there wouldn't be a problem because they're simply being fair but what you see is that all they bring is complaints that's it all they do is say there's something wrong they don't like the music they think you made a mistake they disagree but what about the rest of the video that was three hours what about the rest of the product what about all of that stuff it's amazing I see sometimes also with like you know you send people packages you give them a bunch of extra stuff for free and you send it I don't know whatever day you send it people that expected it to come I don't know five minutes after they ordered it they already send you complaints when is it coming can you give me a tracking number can you tell me when you're gonna send it can you let me know when it's gonna arrive it did it this it did it that 500 complaints but when they get a package that's four times the size of what they ordered with a bunch of stuff for free silence no thank you no nothing why is that the people's nature that when something is wrong we're in a hurry to complain complain to Hashem complain to our parents complain to our spouses complain to our kids complain 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 but when something good happens it's almost like yeah that's what's supposed to be what 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 thanks thanks like as if you're doing somebody a favor 
that's the nature of what happened to the children of Israel and it was one of the reasons to justify the slavery for 210 years when Moshe Rabbeinu saw this he said this now explains why everything is that this explains everything so now okay Moshe you saw this problem go fix it you be the leader you be the leader what does he tell Hashem no no I'm not a man of words what do you mean you're not a man of words you're suffering from me says since you were a kid you're crying over them day and night you're praying about them all the time now you're telling me you're not a man of words then who is you're the one that identified the root of the problem they're not grateful they say Lashonara. they do all types of things wrong you're the perfect solution no 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 there's no way there's no way I'm not the right solution why is Moshe Rabbein who argue with Hashem and that's the essence the last point before we go into questions why is Moshe Rabbein who argue with Hashem not to be the guy because of Moshe Rabbeinu's humility because of Moshe Rabbeinu's righteousness he says listen Hashem you're right I can do this job but if it's gonna come at the cost of offending my older brother Aaron that's also righteous that also loves Am Yisrael that's also going to follow the Torah from Aleph Ataf it's not worth it if my mitzvah of serving you to the highest level will hurt my fellow Jew it's not worth it it's not worth it I'm not talking about hurting a Jew that's a wicked Jew I'm talking about hurting a Jew that's a righteous Jew hurting a Jew that's a wicked Jew like an Ephraim Goldberg that's endangering the Jewish people is a mitzvah because in essence hurting him is hopefully helping him and others but to hurt Aaron Cohen, to hurt someone that's righteous that's also following the Torah, also loves Am Yisrael, that's not worth it. It's not worth it. I want the job. I can do the job, Hashem. But I don't want to do it if it's going to hurt somebody that also is capable, also is a right fit. And Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, no, 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 don't worry. Actually, Aaron will go out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will rejoice in his heart. Not because he misses his brother that he hasn't seen in 60 years, but rather because he sees that you are the messenger. You are the Mashiach that's going to take Am Yisrael you have the answers you've been chosen by Hashem due to your actions that in itself will make him happy why because if he is righteous he wants more righteousness to be out there he's not looking for righteousness to be just in himself someone that loves Torah wants more people to learn Torah someone that loves Hashem wants more people to serve Hashem someone that loves himself wants everything to come to himself wants all the money to himself wants all the honor to themselves wants all the knowledge to themselves so but when somebody loves Hashem they want to spread Hashem's word everywhere when somebody loves the Torah they want to spread the Torah everywhere when somebody loves Am Yisrael they want Am Yisrael to follow Hashem but that also means that that somebody has to see the problem because you can't give them the Torah you can't get them close to Hashem you can't get them to be blessed so long as they don't see straight so long as they're not grateful for what they already have so long as they don't understand that they have an obligation to Hashem not a suggestion meaning that your love of the Jews doesn't come at the cost of the Torah but rather the opposite your love of the Jews is due to your love and compliance of the Torah this is what made Moshe Rabbeinu the perfect leader he was grateful for what he had he knew his abilities but he only thought perhaps his brother also is in the same level Hashem says in a certain way he is but since you discovered the answer that the root of the problem is lack of gratitude and 
baseless hatred of, of saying Lashon Hara, all types of things that are against the Torah. This is the root of the problem. It's not the what's the obvious to everybody, but rather something that most people don't even think is a big deal. You discovered the root of the problem, you will carry the message. Bezot Hashem, this too, will give each one of us enough insight to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, by becoming more grateful, by becoming more aware that each and every one of our decisions should and always be based on how it agrees or disagrees with the Torah, not based on some imaginary outcome that we think we have. We can have ambition, but that ambition cannot come at the cost of the Torah. With that being said, we're going to get a little closer to the screen so we can read some of your questions. And then Mezot Hashem, go from there. All right, I'm going to get a drink. Where's my cup? I already did a blessing on it before. Okay, let's see. Okay, so the first question that I see is from Robert. Uh, question, if a Noah Hyde has a construction company and he gets a job for demolition of a church, uh, can that know how he uses employees to do the work without entering idol worshiping place? B, can his partner do the work and keep all the profits for himself? Is it unclear to, uh, if they will keep it as a church or a different business after demolition? Or is it better for them to say no for that job? No, destroying a church is a fantastic thing to do. Sure, you should take the job. It's a mitzvah. You should keep all the money. Absolutely. What they do after that is not your problem. If you're a, uh, your job is to destroy stuff and you get the, uh, uh, the merit to destroy a uh, place of idolatry, it's fantastic. You should do it. You should be excited to do it. You should be celebrating the whole time. There's even a special bracha. There's even a special blessing to be made after a church is destroyed and uprooted from the world. And we thank Hashem for uprooting idolatry from the world. Next question, Bat Israel is asking, Kvodav, what is the halacha on the fruits from Israel? Example, olives. I'm sorry, your question just... Okay. Olives that have to be from Israel in order to be permitted to be eaten. Oh, so, I mean, if you have the, uh, the issues of Shemitah you're talking about, generally speaking, if you're getting stuff from israel uh then uh you know it's it's if it's coming from you know if it's at a kosher market they are already worrying for the problem for you as far as shemitah whether they do you know but if uh, you're getting it from a uh a non-jewish place typically they don't carry fruits from israel uh so uh you know the kosher places are already taking that into account and they're already already uh using certain fruits certain things are not available certain uh, things uh are available uh but uh but the store is already taking care of that for you so you don't have to worry about you know if you if it's sold at the kosher store then you can eat it no problem uh jack says i love the stump the rabbi favorite series uh charlie okay uh, typically how long does the personal prayer for a person last what is it necessary to pray for the same thing every day why is it necessary to pray for the same thing every day? Okay, so these are two questions. How long is a personal prayer? That all depends on your kavana. Depends on your your intention. Uh, yeah, we parashat uh, vayit hanan. We see that Moshe Rabbeinu prayed five hundred and fifteen times for Hashem to change the decree and allow him to go to Eretz Yisrael. But after five hundred fifteen times, Hashem said Rav Lach, meaning enough. Don't pray anymore because if you pray one more time. I uh, will uh, I will have to uh, say yes, and I don't want to say yes. I don't want to change the decree. I want you to not come to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, so from there we learn that um, if uh, somebody prays, if somebody prays, 
and they don't get an answer uh, that's either because they haven't prayed enough or the answer is no. Since we don't know whether it's no or they haven't prayed enough, we simply always recommend to pray more. How long a prayer should be, it all depends on how much a person wants something. Uh, we see that in this week's parasha that uh, Am Yisrael was uh, suffering tremendously uh, from the enslavement of, uh, of the, uh, the Egyptians and all the killings and the torture and everything that we're going through. Uh, so they were screaming to Hashem. They were screaming to Hashem. And uh, it says, Vaishma Elohim et Nakatam. That uh, Hashem uh, heard their outcry and he remembered his covenant. So, uh, meaning that Hashem was waiting for the prayer of the children of Israel. Hashem wants the prayers. Hashem wants the prayers. He wants us to want it. The more we pray, the more in, uh, kavanah in our prayer, the more Hashem knows how important something is for us. If a person's life on the line they wouldn't ask how long should I pray they would put every single ounce of energy they have into that prayer but if somebody is I don't know just wants uh, to have a chicken sandwich for dinner most likely they're not gonna pray for more than a minute why because it's not exactly that uh, that important to them they will also eat some peanut butter and jelly too so it all depends on how important a, 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 something is to you the more important it is the more you should uh, invest into it that's one as far as why is it necessary to pray every day in essence the uh first and foremost again like i said it all depends on how important a prayer is to you because uh we see from the torah that the uh, hashem desires the prayers of the righteous uh, so much so that he even made our matriarchs our uh, the, the wives of avraham Yitzhak, and yaakov he made them uh, barren because he all of them are ba- were barren because he wanted them to pray he wanted them to cry in essence, uh, the uh, the verse that Shlomo Melech says that Hashem rebukes the right those he loves is that Hashem gives different tests to the people he loves because he wants their prayer. This is in essence a way of how Hashem shows his love and how he wants to see the love reciprocated by uh, by his servants. That's number one. Second thing is is that sometimes there is a uh, certain prerequisites for certain things to happen. Meaning. Uh, let's say if you work for a certain company and you start off as a, uh, I don't know, as a janitor, okay? But you don't want to be a janitor forever. You want to be an executive. Now you go to the boss, you tell him, listen, I want to be an executive. The executive says, listen, uh, I appreciate that you want it, but just because you want it is not enough. You have to show me you want it. Okay, how could I show you want it? First and foremost, you have to work here for, let's say, five years. Second, you have to put in 10 to 20% extra hours. Third, you have to also uh, volunteer for the organization. Fourth, you also have to come up with new ideas once a year to do whatever it is that you're doing better than how how anybody else did it. So he gives you four different things. If you really want to be an executive, you're going to do all of those things. Now you can say, oh, but why is he asking me to do that? He could ask the same thing. Why are you asking for a better job? You're asking for a better job because you want more. He's asking you to do those things to decide whether you deserve more. And this is the same concept here. Where Hashem says, oh, you want something more. I want to see that you want it more. And sometimes I'll ask you to pray multiple times. Because the gates of heaven have special locks. And sometimes those locks need a single key. Sometimes those locks need a certain code. That's why there is, for example, prayers that we have like the Chidusha Levana that we pray once a month it's uh there's a certain section of that prayer that you have to read three or seven times why do I have to say the same thing three or seven times why isn't what Hashem didn't hear me the first time he heard you even before you said it so why do I have to say it three times why do I have to say it seven times what's the extra for this is similar to how a combination lock works now some locks are simply you put a key and it opens the gate some are combination lock anyone that ever had a combination lock knows combination lock is not just you press a few numbers and that's it sometimes combination lock has certain tricks to it you have to spin it a few times to the right then pick the number 
then spin it a few times to the left and then pick the number and then spin it a few times to the right and then pick the number why can't you just pick those numbers you can but that makes it less val less safe and i'm only going to put a less safe lock on something that's less valuable when something is more valuable i'm going to put something that is uh, that's more more protection so when when hashem is asking you to do the same thing three times seven times however many times that means that if you actually get it right and you open that lock you're going to get something really valuable Tilly's asking when does Shabbat end time list on local calendar or 72 minutes after sunset if you go and uh, get the uh, uh, an app that uh, there is a uh, app called uh, CalJ uh, C A L J uh, that gives and then you put your zip code uh, or you just connect it to the GPS of your phone it'll tell you uh, uh, the times of when Shabbat and holidays begin and end there is also the Rabbeinu Tam uh, that if you want to be more stringent uh, then that ends after uh, it's later on uh, generally speaking I recommend for people that are just starting out uh, to keep just the basics and not to keep the stringencies of Rabbeinu Tam and others uh, just to get you into the system like we say you know keep the basics don't uh, go overboard you know if you've never kept Shabbat in your life or you just started keeping Shabbat in the last year for you to add another hour to your Shabbat uh, unless you really really want to and you know you can do it on a regular basis it's better for you to just keep Shabbat as everybody else is and no problem if you are already doing it for a while and you want to observe Shabbat for even longer and you know that you can do it on a regular basis across the board for Shabbat for holidays for everything then of course you can take on Rabbeinu Tam uh, which uh, extends your Shabbat and holidays uh, more time but uh, like I said most people have trouble observing Shabbat and holidays uh, appropriately to begin with uh you know it's a uh, it's not necessarily the time but even what what they do with the time you know if a person is simply uh you know if he studies Torah and watches Shurim during the week but on Shabbat all he does is eat and sleep he doesn't study doesn't do anything it's better if Shabbat is shorter not longer <laughs> because at least, at least if he goes back to the regular week he'll start learning Torah again uh but if a person learns more Torah has more peace of mind on Shabbat has more is happier on Shabbat is uh, is doing better on Shabbat then yeah sure of course it's better for them to keep more uh but the key is to think about things uh uh as a whole picture either way like I said it's best for a person that's starting out that's relatively new to observe the basic alacha uh not more not less not a minute less not a minute more exactly what it is do what you're supposed to do that's the that's the uh, the best way once a person is already in it and is uh, uh, ready to take on even more, then you know you speak with your rabbi, and you can do more. But uh, if a, a person is uh, just starting out, it's it's, it's best to uh, to uh, you know no, don't alti tzedik a bit, don't be overly righteous. Uh, okay, put in chabad.com. You live and you'll find out. Oh, you're talking about the uh, clock thing, yeah. Uh, there's also a uh, website called Maizmanim. Uh, Maizmanim or Zmanim. Uh, there's uh, CalJ. There's several apps that we have uh, uh, recommended in the past. Uh, if both a person, this is uh, Dennis Peros. If both a person that follows Hashem and an idol worshiper want to pray for a common cause say that there is something both agree is bad and they want it to go away should the one who follows Hashem pray and be part of this or even stronger than normal to bring a surplus of Kedusha compared to the Tuma uh, bring by the prayers of the idol worshiper uh, well I mean the, the, the when a person is praying to Hashem uh, and if let's say for example there's somebody that's praying to an idol right next to him it doesn't uh it doesn't hurt him in any way uh his 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 prayer to idolatry doesn't affect 
the Kedusha that uh, I'm producing. Uh, sure, it's better to go pray with a bunch of righteous people because if you are uh, a Jew and you pray with 10 uh, righteous Jews, then the magnitude of the prayer is much more significant. It's something called a minyan. But if it's one single person praying, uh, you know, the, by himself to, to God, and one guy is praying to, I don't know, some idol, uh, his idolatry is not helping or hurting me. Uh, it's as if it doesn't exist. It's as if it doesn't exist. But uh, should he get together with him? No. Uh, you should not get together with them. The uh, Rambam says that someone that's a uh, uh, idol worshiper, especially if it's a Christian missionary, is not something somebody you should stand next to. And if the person is a Jew, you're not allowed to stand next to them. Uh, Tilly is asking, I tried to make matches. Some of my relatives or general people who call me regarding Shiduchim are unfortunately not Shomer Shabbat or religious at all. Can I set two individuals who are not religious up? I think you asked me this question last week, or somebody else asked this question last week. And as I said, according to Allah, meaning according to the Torah, you are not allowed to make a shiduch between people that are not religious. And the reason why is because people that are not religious are not going to uh, get together like religious people and wait until marriage in order for them to be intimate. People that are not religious are going to do what non-religious people do, which is fulfill their physical desires, meaning that they, they are going to mean if they have uh, developed a certain lust for each other or simply have enough desire, they're going to make a sin uh, by, uh, by committing all types of intimate uh, relations. Now, this is a very big sin. It's a, uh, called Gilui Arayot. The woman is Nida. And uh, because she's not married, so therefore she didn't go to the mikveh. So both of them get a isur karet, which is the worst punishment in the world. And the person that put them together also gets that same punishment because they actually enabled them to do that. So in essence, if you want to bring a death penalty upon yourself, then go ahead and make shiduchim with irreligious people. But if you don't want a death penalty for yourself from heaven, and you don't want to bring problems to your life from heaven, and you want a blessing, stay away from irreligious people. Uh, they don't need your help to find a match. Uh, they don't need your help to find a match. There is a uh, story that uh, I just uh, heard from Rabbi Ephraim that's recently published in the new Sefer about uh, the uh, stories of Rabbi Vadya. One of his uh, family members uh, said a story, we witnessed it himself. Uh, one of the older uh, children, uh, who of course are all you know, older tzaddikim now, and they said that the um, uh, Rabbanit Margalit, the wife of Rabbi Vadya, she uh, was a, uh, uh, raised by her aunt, her uh, two aunts, because her mom died. And um, then she eventually uh, you know, moved to Eretz Israel and they stayed in Syria. She, of course, got married to Rabbi Ovadia, and uh, they started building a family. And uh, one day she gets the uh, message that this aunt is coming to Eretz Israel from Syria. And the uh, first place she's coming is to come visit her. You know, they haven't seen each other in many, many years. This is a very emotional event or excitement. So the aunt comes. She sees the Rabbanit, a lot of tears and crying. And then... The, uh, the aunt takes a step back and she looks at her and she says to the Rabbanit, what is this uh, towel on your head? This shmata on your head? And she takes her hand and she rips it out. She goes, take this shmata off. Never wear it. Your hair is beautiful. Now all of, you know, the, the children, Ravadia were there. And of course, the Rabbanit was, you know, couldn't say a single word from the shock of, of, of this thing happening, she took off her kisui rosh, Ravadia, without skipping a beat, went up to this aunt and told her, get out of my house. No questions asked, no second chance, get out of my house. Out. Of course, everybody got shocked. Took a few days for the Rabbanit to, you know, 
get ourselves together of what just happened. But anyway, time passed. Time passed, and the uh, Rav Vadya became the Rav Vadya that people know, the Gedol Adol, the Rishon Etzion. And this aunt, her kids, all did tshuva. But none of them were able to find a shiduch. None of them were able to find a shiduch. So she calls the, uh, the Rabbanit uh, Magalit, her, uh, her niece, the wife of Rabbi Vadya, and she says, it's impossible for, uh, my, for me to get a blessing, for my kids to get married from Rabbi Vadya, who's now known as a big tzaddik. Kodesh Kodeshim. So the Rabbanit says, I'll ask. I'll ask. Of course, the story happened years before that, but still, it was such a shocking story. It's not like uh, somebody could easily forget it, but nonetheless, she asked for the blessing. So Rabbi Vadya, of course, remembered the story. So when the Rabbanit came to him and asked him, you know, what, do you, what about a blessing for our kids? None of our kids are able to find a shiduch. Rabbi Vadya, who remembered the story well, says to the Rabbanit, tell her I said, the day she herself puts on a kisui rosh and commits to wearing it for the rest of her life, her kids will find a shiduch. Obviously, this is not an easy thing to go tell somebody, especially someone that helped raise you. It's like a, like a mom. And even more so, it's a touchy subject because she's the very same person that took off her kids and even though her kids did tshuva still she was uh you know still not wearing kids but she went to her and she told her my husband said the day you put on a kids your kids will find a shiduch and as hard as it was for this woman to accept this because of course she is committed to be against this for many years of her life but who loves the kids more than a mother? And she said, you know what? Maybe a person could say that they'll figure out a way to justify their lack of serving Hashem, their lacking is their shortage in serving Hashem by doing some other good. Everybody rationalizes things. But if you say, oh, if I do this, my kids will get a blessing, many mothers get enticed. And she did it, and that week, she took on the mitzvah of Kisu Rosh, and that week, her kids started finding a shiduch, one after another, like a domino effect. One after another. Meaning that all of the kids' fortune, all of the kids' future, everything was put on hold in heaven for this to happen. For this to happen. Now, this reminds me of another story, real life story, getting it firsthand from our dear Rosh Kolel, Arab Sharvit. This is live, happened in the last week, two weeks. A, uh, I don't know if the story, I think the story also happened. Like a, I was told the story in the last week. And I think the story itself happened also recently. I don't know exactly the time of the story, but it's recently. It's not like 50 years ago or anything. So Rav Shalvit says, he has some family, that are big tzaddikim, but he has part of the family that are not exactly observant of Torah and Mitzvot. And uh, he tried encouraging them, telling them this, telling them that, but, you know, some people are like a... Uh, Metal heads, they don't, uh, they don't listen until Hashem gives them a personal lesson. And one of the uh, couples in the family does not even keep family purity. That's one of the top things that's most difficult for people that are not observant, where they're able to keep Shabbat, they're able to keep kosher, they're able to you know, keep different holidays, but when it comes to family purity... It's almost impossible for some people. They think, ah, whatever, I'm only going to be 
with my wife or with my husband half the month. We can't sleep in the same bed. That's fanatic. I don't think that's what God really cares about. And they'll say all types of stupid things to justify their crime. The truth is that this is a biblical law. Family purity is a biblical law. It's in fact, if a woman is not willing to go to the mikveh, you have to divorce her. If a man does not allow his wife to go to the mikveh, you have to divorce him. It's not like if they don't keep Shabbat or if they don't keep kosher. If a woman does not keep Tarat Mishpacha or the husband is not willing to allow her to keep Tarat Mishpacha, that's it, that's the end of the marriage. Family purity is like it says, family. It's, it, this is, whether there's going to be a family or not is based on this. Now, this couple did not understand the words of Arav Shavit when he tried to warn them and tried to tell them. And the Gemara Masechet Shabbat says that the time of danger for women that are at birth, uh, 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 delivering a baby is if they were not careful with Nida, with the issues of Tarat Mishpacha or with the issues of uh, uh, keeping Shabbat, uh, lighting the candles, or Afrashat uh, Chala. People that do not observe family purity do not realize that every second they're in danger. Every second. It's not like a one-time danger. Every single second they're in danger. Their life is in danger. So anyway, this family member of Rav Shavit, and he asked us to publicize the story, his family member in Rav Shavit says that they, uh, they were pregnant and uh, the time came and uh, to deliver the baby. So the guy calls Rav Shavit. He says, oh, please pray. The water broke. We're on the way to the hospital. Rav Shavit was well aware of the spiritual situation here says pray yeah we need to pray but he understands right now is the most dangerous time of this person's life because not like they didn't know they knew they just simply didn't think it was a big deal didn't decide to keep family purity why because you could have a baby with or without family purity so they figured what if i can have a baby either way as long as my body works the organs work the cells work the chromosomes the dna the the, the all molecules and the acids and the <laughs> and proteins and everything is good what do i need family purity what what, what is this as a kadosh who thought was not the same thing as what they thought why shortly after that call of pray we're on the way to the hospital, another call came in. The baby came out, but there was a certain germ that came into the woman's body that's called like a destructive germ. That a person that has this in their body, simply they have usually about 24 or 48 hours before they die. It's a very strange to even understand the doctor said that they had this and they have to save her life they cut and remove the uterus itself please pray shortly later calls again the doctors said that somehow it was not just the uterus they thought that by cutting the uterus out they're gonna save her but unfortunately was already somehow went to other parts of the body doctors are saying she may have a day possibly a day and a half to live please pray Rav Shavit was an extraordinary Talmud Chacham and a Tzaddik no this is not the time to twiddle his thumbs it's also not the time to say oh Bezat Hashem things will be okay he says to this family member he says I'm telling you something right now in the name of the Tzadikim Rav Zilber said this in the name of Rav Kanievsky he said 
if you take on you teach somebody that's not keeping Torah and mitzvot, that's not observant, and you convince them to take something big that's one of the foundations of Judaism and make a commitment to do it, not one time, but permanently, you can promise them miracles. So Rav Shavit says to him, you want your wife to live? The guy is crying hysterical. Yeah, of course, what do you mean? Go to the hospital, back to the bed. I know she's in a coma. She's dying. Go next to her. Pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Tell him, Hashem, I'm sorry. We didn't keep Tarat Mishpacha. But I promise you that from now on, no matter what, we are going to keep Tarat Mishpacha. And you say it right next to her so she hears it. Even though she's in a coma, her neshama hears. The guy says, are you, are you serious? He said, you want it to live or you want it to die? Okay, I'm going to do it right now. The guy says, he went, already the doctors were pretty much have given up. They've already called the news. The news came to report this thing that this strange germ entered another person and killed another person in 24 hours. They were looking to report it. The news was there. Everything, everything was happening. The guy came in, doctor just told him, please, you have to say goodbye. It's not, told him, okay, give me a few minutes. The guy comes in and he does exactly as Rav Shavit said. He cries to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he says, I'm sorry. But I promise you, Hashem, you give us a chance. From now on, no matter what, we are going to keep family purity. Two days later, She's back home with the baby, perfectly healthy, as if never happened. Nothing ever happened. The doctors did not even know what to do with themselves. They were expecting this person to die within a matter of hours. Suddenly, all the charts change. Everything changes. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided for it to change. Open miracle, seen with eyes. Not some strange... Story from far away, story firsthand. So we see here there's certain things in the Torah that are not things that would make sense. The whole issue of trying to make sense out of everything is a problem. Why? Because a person that tries to rationalize everything is going to have a very, very difficult time believing in the Torah. And in fact, the whole issue of purity has a uh, is, is something that doesn't make any sense and the rambam writes in the uh, ilchot uh, mikvaot in uh, chapter 11 alakha number 12 the last alakha he writes that it's clear and apparent that the concept of purity and impurity are scriptural decrees they're not matters determined by a person's understanding and they're included in the category of chukim, which are mitzvot that cannot be grasped by uh, uh, mortal uh, understanding. Rather, it's Kabbalah and acceptance of Hashem's uh, yoke. Similarly, the immersion in a mikveh to ascend from impurity, in order for a person to purify themselves, a woman goes to a mikveh, there's an obligation for her to do it, a man is not obligated to go to a mikveh, but it's good for him to do it once in a while. There's an issue of, uh, uh, of purity. At the Bet HaMikdash, when somebody had to do the sacrifices, they had to go to a mikveh. But if you had in your mind the thought of the wrong korban, the wrong sacrifice in your mind, then you have to do it all over again. You can't just do one dip for all of the sacrifices. If you had to do, let's say, multiple korbanot, it's multiple dips. Multiple times you have to go to a mikveh. Now this doesn't make any sense. Why? Because what's happening? You're just going into a pool. The Rambam says, the immersion in a mikveh to ascend from impurity is included in the category of chukim because impurity is not mud. And it's not filth, 
that can be washed away by water. Instead, the immersion in a mikveh is a scriptural, a scriptural decree and requires the focusing, the intent of a person's heart, meaning it requires kavanah. Therefore, our sages said, this is in the Gemara, Masechet Chagigah, page 19a, when a person is immersed, but he did not intend to purify himself, it's as if he did not immerse. Now, although it's a scriptural decree, this is a decree that's written in Torah, written Torah, there's an illusion involved where one who focuses his heart on purifying himself, doing tshuva. So one focuses on on purifying himself, becomes purified once he immerses, even though there was no change in his body. And similarly, one who focuses his heart on purifying his soul from the impurities of the soul, which are wicked thoughts, bad character traits, that person then becomes purified when he resolves within his own heart to distance himself from such counsel that's telling him to do those bad things, and he immerses his soul in the waters of knowledge, water meaning Torah. As the prophet Yechizkel chapter 36 verse 25 says, I will pour over you pure water and you will be purified from all of your impurities and from all of your false deities. I will purify you. May God in his abundant mercy purify us from all sin and transgressions and guilt. This is the Rambam, it's Psak Alacha, meaning that Bisyat Dishmaya had this, didn't know when it's going to be included in the Shiur, but of course it came now. And the beautiful thing is, the Rambam says that there are certain obligations that we have to accept the Torah at face value even when we know it doesn't make any sense. And it's not a suggestion, but rather an obligation. So even though some of the things that I'll tell you will not make sense because you could figure out any type of rational argument to justify it. You could say, listen, I could get these two people that are not observant of Torah together maybe they'll be happier and they'll see that a religious person made them uh, get together and therefore they're going to want to be religious or you can say i can make this religious person go and get together with a non-religious person and therefore the religious person will make the non-religious person religious now both of these things make rational sense according to that theory but both are forbidden according to the torah why because you're not allowed to enable people that do not observe Torah to sin. And also you're not allowed to take somebody that's Torah observant and put them at risk. So whether it makes sense or it doesn't make sense, a person that observes the Torah needs to know it's not a matter of whether it makes sense or not. It's a matter of whether we accept Hashem and His Torah completely or not, regardless of whether it makes sense or not. And when we do, we could assure ourselves that we're going in the right direction and perhaps even we'll see some open miracles. Okay, let's see. Donna's asking, Hello, Rabbi, if a woman is pretty and dresses modest according to Allah, and guys still look, does she get a punishment? Uh, to be pretty is a responsibility. It's not a, uh, 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 a bad thing. It's just simply a responsibility. So a woman is allowed to be pretty. Some of the most righteous women that ever lived were very, very beautiful women. And uh, Sarah Imenu was the most beautiful woman that ever lived. But even her own husband did not know how beautiful she truly was until later on in their life because of how modest she was. Rachav, that was the wife of Yeshua Benun, used to be a prostitute and ended up becoming the wife of the Gdolador and the uh, seven prophets came out of her. 
She was a very, very righteous woman. And many, many other righteous women were beautiful people. Beautiful, beautiful people, both in and out. So to be beautiful is not a uh, bad thing, but rather if a person knows that it's a responsibility, that they need to know how to make their beauty shown only to the right person. Only to the right person. So if a woman is truly modest according to Allah, she's wearing the clothes according to Allah, not the minimum. Like many people say, listen, the, uh, the Allah says to wear the, uh, the dress has to reach the six inches below the knee. So that's what I do. It's six inches below the knee exactly. Okay, you can do that, but you're playing with fire. The six inches below the bottom of the knee after you sit down, it's the minimum. It's not the suggested. The suggested is to wear something much longer. So you don't ever play with the, you know, the, the, the fire. So a person that is truly modest doesn't go anywhere near the minimum requirement. They're going to do whatever they need to do in order to make sure that they are beautiful for their husband, but they're not attracting attention. She's not a walking traffic light. She's not wearing things that every person, both blind, deaf, stupid, and uh, 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 LGDP are going to look at her. No. She going to be beautiful not a problem but to be attractive to the point where everybody's going to look at her that's definitely her own doing if it's not her own doing meaning if she's truly modest and people still look at her it's not a problem at all it's not our problem and the reason why is because if she's truly modest that means that she has that means that she's going to have not just modesty of dress but also modesty of behavior modesty of the way she speaks she's not going to speak to a bunch of guys because she can wear what the muslim wear where they you know cover their face they wear some sack on top of their body but if she's talking to a bunch of guys or every time she laughs or says hello the whole neighborhood finds out then that's not modest modesty is behavior as well as clothing if she's truly modest in behavior as well as in clothing then perfectly fine but always remember, guys, always remember, girls, that modesty does not mean ugly. Modesty does not mean ugly. In fact, a woman needs to take care of herself just like a man needs to take care of themselves. We're not supposed to go look like some garbage pail, especially the women. Especially the women. Sometimes I see that there is a new bale tshuva or uh, people that are not necessarily so familiar with the halakha, where a woman does tshuva and she decides to just simply says, oh, I'm now becoming righteous, so she just lets herself go. She lets herself go. She doesn't wear makeup anymore. She, uh, you know, wears uh, one uh, one uh, dress, you know, for uh, for a month straight. She doesn't care about the colors. She doesn't care if it matches. She looks like she's going to a funeral every day. That's not a mitzvah. That's not a mitzvah. Why? Because what's going to end up happening? It's going to cause her husband to either leave her or cheat on her. So Rabbi Chanina, Gemara Masechet Tanit, Rabbi Chanina Ben Dosa. When he came back home from uh, work, his wife would uh, would come out in beautiful dress to welcome her husband. When the Talmidim asked him, Rabbi, why does your wife wear such fancy clothes to welcome you? Rabbi Kharina, Kodesh Kodeshim says, because she knows if she does that, I'm not going to look anywhere else. What? Rabbi Kharina? Yes, Rabbi Kharina says, my wife dresses extra beautiful, so I don't look anywhere else. Why? Because that is the nature of men. So, a woman that is righteous needs to know that it's to be beautiful is a responsibility. Meaning, I need to be beautiful for my husband. Not for Carlos from the supermarket, Jose from the muffler shop, and Steve from the kiosk that sells ice cream. No, not for those people. I need to look for, you know, reserved, modest, no problem. Whatever beauty Hashem blessed you with is not a problem. But as far as the uh, the uh, attractive, to be a person that's attracting attention, that I'm not going to do. But as far as to be modest, that doesn't mean that I'll become ugly. Why? I'm not allowed to become ugly. I'm not allowed to become ugly because ugliness will lead my husband to look elsewhere. Ugliness will lead me to stay alone. Ugliness leads to sins and problems. Ugliness leads to depression. We're not allowed to be ugly. 
we have to take care of ourselves to the best of our abilities while observing the halakha. The Torah is for us to live by it, not to die by it. So that means that a woman has to know that there are halachot of the clothes. The clothes needs to be loose, not ugly. They can still be beautiful clothes, just needs to be loose, needs to be long. The head covering could be beautiful. She could have a beautiful, I don't know, whatever color she likes. She could have all types of stones on it if she wants. She can make it a beautiful crown. Doesn't need to be ugly. She could be make it beautiful if she wants. There are some uh, uh, websites and different, uh, uh, you know, righteous women that have, uh, you know, all types of uh, videos about how they uh, make their kisui rosh, their headscarf, look beautiful and fun. It's mitzvah to do that. Mitzvah, it's zeh veo. This is a, my God and I will uh, make it more beautiful. It's a mitzvah to make the mitzvah beautiful. So the dress, perfectly fine for it to be beautiful. In fact, the mitzvah to make it beautiful. Modest and beautiful is a mitzvah. It's an extra mitzvah. Modest is a mitzvah. Beautiful is a mitzvah. But attractive is a different story. Attracting attention, meaning that this dress is a, either a specific color or it has specific designs on it or pattern that lead people to look specific places. So if you have one of these dresses that has specific patterns that are pointing to specific parts of the body, obviously this is forbidden. That ruins the whole dress, even if the dress is a sack that's enough for six people and you're barely 30 pounds, it's still not modest. Why? Because there are patterns or different writings on it that are on the uh, uh, areas where men look, or even if women look, whatever it is, not allowed. So the, 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 the dress patterns matter. Design matters. How loose it is matters. How long it is matters. But it doesn't mean it can't be beautiful. It should be beautiful. It should be very beautiful, especially for your husband. And in fact, there are certain types of clothes only your husband should uh, watch. Beautiful clothes, modest clothes, but only your husband should, should see them. You should only have them on Shabbat for him or when, whenever you guys are, are, are home and you're not necessarily uh, wanted to uh, go out. Many women reserve their most beautiful dresses for events. For bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, all types of mitzvah. In reality, sometimes it's not a mitzvah. And what I suggest is those beautiful dresses, instead of spending thousands of dollars on a dress that you're going to you know, wear once in your life or once every five years, use that money, buy yourself a dress that you're going to use every weekend with your husband. Why? Because that's much more valuable. That's a real mitzvah. For your husband to see you beautiful is a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. What? It encourages him to be with you. It encourages him to, to appreciate modesty as well as Torah. But unfortunately, many times people let themselves go because they think it's a mitzvah to look like, a, I don't know, like they just came out of the Holocaust. It's not a mitzvah. A woman should be reserved. Also, makeup. There's alachot when it comes to makeup. Don't put enough makeup on your face where it looks like you're a traffic light everywhere you go there's like light coming out of your face you know some women they put this makeup that it's like neon don't do that but nobody says look like you just came out of a, a, a six-week fast put some makeup on you could put uh, blush on whatever it is basic minimum things that make you uh look presentable look uh, your best unless you don't want to if that's your natural look you can but again it's 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 there's no obligation to put makeup on there's no obligation to to do a lot of things but to look terrible on purpose that's a problem that's a problem why because some people think it's you're supposed to look terrible because you're religious it's absolutely false you're supposed to look good like a attract a, a a beautiful person that hashem gave you a gift perfectly fine what you're not supposed to do is look attractive to the wrong people to the wrong people but at home with your husband perfectly fine and even if you go out you're allowed to look decent there's no no problem with looking decent just don't act in a certain way or wear certain things in a certain way that will in essence give people the extra help to uh to know where to look
So there's certain alachot when it comes to makeup. There's certain alachot that it comes to uh, the dress. There's certain alachot when it comes to covering the hair. It's really not that difficult, believe it or not. I know it's difficult to find certain things, and I know certain women that they've uh, they just simply uh, they have the the money. They get custom clothes. They have somebody. They hire some uh, dresses, a dressmaker, and uh, they uh, tell the people exactly what to make them, and, and that's how they do it. Some women they try to you know shop. And until they find the right thing that fits the right way. Some people sew things themselves, where they buy something and then they fix it themselves. Different women do different things. I know it's very hard to find the, the, the perfect modest dress that looks good, uh, at the same time as modest. I understand it's a problem. Uh, you know, I wasn't born yesterday. But again, it's, it's, it's do not think that the Torah is there to turn you into some garbage pail kid where simply you know you are gonna you, people are gonna know you're religious because it's gonna look like you just came out of some you know uh, fast that's not the way it's supposed to be it's supposed to look d- decent especially when it comes to your husband but even on a regular day to day even on a regular day to day should always look. my also my side suggestion is uh, and i'm telling you from Bo hashem marriage of almost 20 years one of the things that, uh, that my wife taught me, my wife, the Rabbanit, she's uh, most amazing, most beautiful, extraordinary person on planet Earth. But one of the things that I learned from her all the time, all the time I learned different things from her. One of the things that, that she, I remember her giving advice to a uh, young girl, and she told her this, said, make sure your husband never sees you look like you just woke up. What does that mean? Many times, I'm not really sure when this exactly happened, but at some point or another, women, I guess, I don't know, maybe of this generation, uh, decided that uh, they're going to reserve all of their beauty for the outside, but when they're inside, they look like they're, they're wearing pajamas, pretty much, almost all the time, and they look like they're just either going to sleep or just woke up. And the Rabbanit says, this should never be. And I can tell you from experience. And <laughs> Baruch Hashem, we're together almost 20 years. I've never seen my wife. Never seen my wife not look her best. To me, she always looks like she just came out of some planet of gift or something. It's amazing. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to, to uh, give, I'm trying to teach you something. I'm trying to t- teach the, the ladies as well as the men that if you want to uh, truly understand how to keep marriage healthy and happy there are just certain things that for whatever reason or another have been forgotten in the world where people are the most obnoxious immodest ugly way of behaving outside but for whatever reason or another inside their house they i don't know like something like transforms in them it's the it's supposed to be really the opposite but what i'm trying to tell you is that to look decent is not something that uh, a person should do only sometimes a woman that wants to keep herself as well as the her, her husband and believe it or not even her kids happy and confident should always look her best should always look her best which means she has to do a little bit of extra work to do some of these things whether it's wake up a little earlier or it's a uh, 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 whatever, whatever it is that women need to do to, to, to look like they're angels. Uh, but the point is, is that it, it is a something that is very, very valuable. Because I know from different uh, marriages that I've, I've tried to guide and help, one of the issues that people tell me is, is this particular issue where they, uh, they tend to see their wives more like they're about to go to sleep or just woke up then they do get to see them when uh you know they, they're they're out they you know it's it's they have to wait for a bar mitzvah or some wedding to see their wife look good and that's not a good thing that's not a good thing at all a woman should always look good why because that's how hashem created you that's how hashem created men that's how hashem created men but again looking good does not mean being a zona does not mean uh, being somebody that's uh, yearning for attention from any Joe that's going to whistle like a dog. No. Looking good for your husband, priority, and that's perfectly fine. And even a mitzvah, especially when it's going to encourage your husband uh, and you to have even more love. 
hopefully this was uh, informative for the right people. Uh, we'll take another one or two questions. It's kind of late. Uh, let's see, Jack. Uh, okay. Hi, Rabbi. I have a question. I have tenants that lived by us for a few years. They literally destroyed the place, huge holes in the walls, all over the place, missing cabinets, totally trashed by Froom people. What do I do now? Some people say it's Lashon HaRa to talk about it. I said it's not because they left it for the public to see. And on top of it, it's, it's theft to leave a place in shambles. Is it Lashon HaRa? And how should I resolve this? I'm sick to my stomach. How these people acted like pure Chazirim. Okay, so to go and tell the world about it, no. You, don't, uh, you should not do that. Uh, don't tell the world about it. Uh, but uh, if you had a certain contract, uh, an understanding that uh, they were supposed to uh, give back the place the way that they got it, uh, then you have to go to a Bedin. You have to go to a Bedin. At the Bedin, you're allowed to tell them everything. It's not considered Lashon Ara because it's for the sake of helping and getting to the truth. And uh, they'll, if, if the Bedin uh, sees your proofs versus their argument... Uh, and seize your case, they'll have to pay you. They'll have to pay you the damages. That is the only appropriate step that you can do as far as doing something about it. The other option is simply never talking about it again and simply accepting it with love, forgiving them completely, because if you don't forgive them, then you're right, they'll have to be reincarnated, but so will you, in order for them to pay you back what they stole from you. So if you can forgive them completely and never talk about it again, forgive them. If you can't forgive them, then go to a Bedin and, uh, and uh, let the Bedin resolve this issue. Resolve this issue. If, uh, if you're right, then the Bedin will, uh, will rule in your favor. If you're wrong, then the Bedin will rule in their favor. But at the very least, you'll have an outcome once and for all, according to the Torah, and uh, you'll be finished and absolved from uh, any more hatred in your heart because it's also a prohibition from hating your brother in your heart. So uh, this feeling that you have right now, I very much understand it. Many, many people uh, that I've dealt with in my life have spit on me in my face, uh, so much so that I'm considering getting an umbrella. Uh, but uh, it's, it's almost standard for people that uh, I've dealt with with monetary issues to do things like that. People are just terrible. I agree with you. But... The Torah is there for us to know what to do in those circumstances. To go talk about it with people is definitely the wrong approach. It's Lashon Ara. Uh, there's no uh, benefit that could come out of it. There's no good that could come out of it. It create a lot of damage. Much worse for them than what they did to you. Because let's say, for example, you say these people are complete Chazirim. And now I don't know who they are. So to say it to me... It doesn't, it's not Lashon Ara because I don't know who they are. You're not mentioning a name. But to go say to somebody that knows who they are and you say, oh, this uh, such and such family are Chazirim, uh, you know, they're, they're pigs, they destroyed my house, they did this, this and that. Okay, so the guy says, oh, so really, wow. My, uh, I, I, thank you for letting me know. And you're like, why? What, what, what thank you? I mean, I understand maybe you like some juicy stories, but why thank you? Oh, so the guy says, oh, because... I, uh, you know, my son was on a shiduch with their daughter. And uh, now that I know that the family is a bunch of pigs, I'm not going to let my son marry this pig. I'd rather marry, uh, you know, marry, marry uh, you know, a, uh, somebody else, not a pig. And then you say, oh, no, sorry, 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 he's not going to help. At that moment, you pretty much murdered these people. You destroyed a marriage and you have a very, very serious bill on your hands. That's almost impossible to pay back. So I promise you, if... You follow what the, uh, I tell you, whether it's, again, either completely, completely forgiving them or going to a Bedin. Those are the two choices you have, and you'll get to the right uh, outcome either way. But uh, to continue uh, just hating them in your heart and, and sharing it with people, worst possible thing you could be doing for yourself because you're getting no benefit out of it and only downside. Your house is not being fixed as a result of it. And even more so, you're collecting sins that Hashem Yishmol can, uh, can be very, uh, very terrible. Uh, so much so that the Chafetz Chaim that um, was uh, meeting somebody, one of the other tzaddikim, and uh, Chafetz Chaim was very uh, particular 
about uh, paying for every single thing, never getting anything from anybody, so nobody would have anything to say about him, so nobody would say Lashonara about him. So one time he was hosted by, uh, by a different rabbi, big rabbi, and the Chafetz Chaim asked him for a piece of paper. So the rabbi, of course, gave the Chafetz Chaim a piece of paper, Chafetz Chaim takes out a coin out of his pocket, and he gives it to him, gives him the coin. And the rabbi says, no, for the rabbi, it's okay, you can have it. He goes, no, no, no. I make sure to pay for everything. He goes, yeah, but it's only one piece of paper. He goes, okay, so I paid for value for one piece of paper. If it's more, tell me. He says, why? He says, because I don't know if you really want to give me the piece of paper or you're just giving it to me because I'm me. And I don't ever want it to be in your mind that this is the case because has for Shalom, this could lead to Lashonara. You saying this to somebody else and that Lashon Ara that you would say one time can create an angel that is big and strong enough to destroy the entire city of Vilna. From just that one act. So I'd rather give you a coin than an angel of destruction being created to destroy the entire city. That's in essence how the Tzadikim were scared of sins. And we're talking about something much smaller much smaller than what you're talking about so that's why i tell you don't talk about people unless it's it, this is something for the sake of toilet for the sake of, of helping the issue talking about the strangers talking about the neighbors not going to help it it's forbidden it's Lashonara. go to a bedding perfectly fine perfectly fine it's a uh, it'll resolve it once and for all and perhaps even uh, if you are uh shown that you're correct It'll also help them, even though they'll have to pay you. It'll help them know not to do it again. It'll help them know not to do it again. And if, if you are wrong, then it'll help you know that in reality you were wrong and, and you know you had no case to, to say Lashon about them. But either way, you'll get to a resolution. That's what you do. Uh, Isai says, is a Jew allowed to own firearms or even touch or shoot them on a range? Uh, sure, I mean, we have uh, Jewish uh, soldiers... Uh, throughout all of history, uh, to go and own a firearm. I mean, if you have, uh, if it's for the sake of protection, uh, sure. I mean, there's no no problem with it. Just I would recommend being very careful if you have kids. Uh, many times there is a, uh, the houses that have accidents are houses where somebody uh, is not careful enough. And everybody says they're going to be careful, but, you know, kids are curious and they, always want what they can't have especially if it's in a suitcase locked away really high they're not supposed to know that it exists and you know so uh, i don't recommend it uh but if somebody has it they're allowed to have it yeah as far as going to a shooting range in order to practice to know how to shoot yes if you have a weapon you need to know how to use it sure but again i wouldn't make that a uh something i invest too much time in uh because uh Quite frankly, at the end of the day, Hashem is the only one that's going to decide whether I live or die, not the gun. Uh, Meli is asking, if Hashem gives us all houses, why don't we celebrate? If America celebrates, America and Jerusalem celebrates, Jerusalem, why doesn't Palestine celebrate Palestine? I'm sorry, I'm not following. What, what are you talking about? Um... No idea what you're talking about. Sorry. Uh, past performance, no indicate. Oh, yeah, that's actually an industry term from the uh, investment firm, investment uh, world. It's a well-known industry term. I didn't create it. Uh, okay. All right. Well, last question. Yeah. Last question. Let's see. Uh, Rabbi, we know that there are cases where one is exempt from a mitzvah. For example, a person without arms would be exempt from tefillin. Not true. Uh, I'll explain in a second. If there is a person who comes from a 100% from family with a perfect education such as such that all the siblings turned out completely from, but he himself went on to become an atheist. Does this person go to Genom? It could be argued that they are severely mentally ill and therefore exempt, like the tefillin example. I'm sorry, Mordechai, I have no idea how your logic works, but everything you said is wrong. 
as far as being exempt from tefillin, although the person has no arms, that only exempts him from the tefillin of the arms. He's not exempt from the tefillin of the head. He still has to put the tefillin of the head. So uh, if he has a head, he has to put the tefillin of the head. He, uh, if he doesn't have arms, then he doesn't have to put the tefillin of the arms. A person that is an atheist, regardless of where they came from, whether they came from a completely firm family, or a family full of secular atheists, or a family full of goyim, a person that's an atheist will go to Genom and never come out. There is no argument that would justify ever being an atheist. Rav Wassim in Allah Shalom has a whole uh, teaching about it, saying that a person that uh, wants to argue the whole issue of atheism, when they go up to heaven, they're going to be given the argument of how could they be an atheist. It's really a lying to yourself. Why is it lying to yourself? It's like a person that was a, uh, went into the desert and all he can see for miles is a desert. Desert, desert, desert. Now, suddenly he sees a castle, a palace. Beautiful palace, brand new. Not a fossil, but something that literally, just a uh, brand new, pristine. He goes inside the palace, he sees everything is clean, everything is brand new, everything is fresh. There's fruits, there's vegetables, there's fresh meats, there's all types of diamonds laying everywhere. And he simply just decides to help himself, opens the fridge, eats, uh, takes everything, starts stuffing his pockets, and all of a sudden, he gets chapcha in the back, he gets hit in the back, tackled and arrested. So what I do? You're a thief. What thief? I, I didn't know anybody owns it. Okay, tell that to the judge. They bring him in front of the judge and the king says to him, how dare you steal from my palace? What's your argument? He says, listen, I was in a desert. I didn't know. And I saw this palace. I didn't know anybody owns it. The king will tell him, you'll get punished double for such an argument. One, for being a thief. Two, for being stupid. Stupid enough to believe and to lie to yourself, to think that the fresh meat came by itself, the diamonds were by itself, the beautiful palace by itself, everything by itself. A person lives in this world. Everything is perfect. You have an ecosystem. You have everything dependent on itself. There's a certain amount of bugs in the world in order to keep the world a certain amount of cleanliness in the world. A certain amount of animals in the world that's also relevant to the amount of fruits, vegetables, and all types of other crops in the world. There's a certain amount of people in the world. A certain amount of air in the world. There's a certain amount of all types of things in the world. Everything is precise. And that's just our world. If you just simply analyze the amount of uh, 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 miracles that have to happen in order for this bubble that you call an eye to work, You realize that this could not have been a happenstance or happening from some type of coincidence or consecutive events. So the point being is anybody that claims atheism is simply a liar, a liar, liar that lies to themselves in order to justify their behavior and they will be punished doubly. So regardless of whether they came from an atheist family or they came from a from family it doesn't make a difference they will get punished severely and a punishment that uh, will not end okay Rabotai, thank you very much for learning with me i appreciate uh, you uh learning and uh, asking and uh like i told you we're gonna have the campaign coming up uh soon uh, in the next day or so everybody uh could please try to do your best to contribute but also even more try to get your friends family uh and everybody else to contribute because we we really want to make it work we really want to make this uh, match we're trying to raise four and a half million dollars but at the very, very, very least, we have to, you know, raise at least a half a million to, to get this to get this match. And uh, it would be fantastic if you guys could help. Uh, again, remember, uh, a, a person that uh, helps another person do a mitzvah is gets even more of a mitzvah than uh, than him getting him doing a mitzvah on their own. So this is a uh, double uh, double reward for a person that uh, helps another person do a mitzvah. 
And uh, again, I know there's other people that do shiurim and other people that uh, uh, are doing campaigns and all types of things. Everybody has to decide what they're going to give to and who they're going to give to based on who they benefit from the most. If you have Rabbi ABC, that is your main teacher that you learn the most from, that you are uh, get the most benefit from, then I personally recommend you donate to them. But if you get your main source of benefit and you get you see that uh, you, uh, you're benefiting from the work that we do, then surely you should donate to our organization. Uh, and uh, if you have the ability to donate to many, uh, you have to decide whether it's worth it for you to donate to many. Some people spread their donations to many places, but it's not really a good investment. And the reason why is because, you know, you have one that's a superstar and another one that's homeless, meaning that one is superstar in mitzvot and he takes that donation and makes it uh, into an entire empire of mitzvot. And the other one, I don't know, maybe he's going to make it into a small little bathroom. So it's not a right thing for a person to donate to both of those parties because you have to treat your donations just like you treat investments. Donations are not about being nice. Donations are about being smart, being smart with your money. And again, it's a, uh, a lot of uh, the people that watch our shuim have been watching for a long time, have been... Uh, telling me that it's changing their life and it's time that we make that change even more. More significant by actually having a place, uh, by having uh, a lot a lot to do and I think that uh, uh, this coming year is going to be a, uh, much, much greater than any, uh, anything we've ever done before. So Be'ezot Hashem will uh, all succeed. Tisku l'mitzvot rabot, b'chah v'atzlacha, Shabbat Shalom. Otuf. אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שערכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, קדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל מה שיפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו, יזכו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. חזק אותו בשביל. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. תעבירו מה שבירכתי אותו. כן, קהילה ספרדית גדולה.